أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وأقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة لهم أجرهم لهم أجرهم عند ربهم ولا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين فإن لم تفعلوا ف ذنوا بحرب من الله ورسوله وإن تبتم فلكم رؤوس أموالكم لا تظلمون ولا تظلمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين فإن لم تفعلوا فأذنوا بحرب من الله ورسوله وإن تبتم فلكم رؤوس أموالكم لا تظلمون ولا تظلمون وإن كان ذو فنظرة إلى ميسرة وأن تصدقوا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون واتقوا يوما ترجعون فيه إلى الله واتقوا يوما ترجعون فيه 
فيه إلى الله ثم توفى كل نفس ما كسبت وهم لا يظلمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم Assalamu alaikum. Before Sheikh Jafar start, I would uh, request from brothers and sisters, please, to fill in the, the gaps. There are seats empty and there are brothers coming, especially the young ones. Please, you can seat Abu Bakr, because uh, I love you, I named you. So please, the brothers, there are many seats here, fill in the, the, the gaps. Even this, the first line, you can come, you can come. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to name. So. Please, please, come. Ajad, you can come in. Jazakumullah khair. So, yeah, feel it. there is another gap here. There is another gap here. Same thing for the sisters. Jazakumullah khair. Sorry for the inconvenience. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب Tonight and this weekend is a very special weekend We are very privileged, we are very blessed to have uh, our dear brother, our sheikh Dr. Ma'an Al-Qudat, inshallah, Sheikh Yassin will introduce him further uh, later on. And we are very happy to have him among us today to cover this very, very important subject. So I'm going to say a few words just to situate the subject, just to put the subject in perspective to see how important it is in our life as Muslims, particularly in us, for us Muslims who are living in the West. So there are about two or three points. Number one, I would like to see the relationship between this subject and our Muslim identity. I believe this subject, just like we are talking about many other subjects, about our spirituality, about the fiqh of our ibadat, how do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how we deal in our relationships, family relationships, brothers and sisters relationships, relationships with non-Muslims. This financial issue is another part of our holistic approach. When we read the Quran and we read the Sunnah and study the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, we come to the conclusion that the human being, humanity in general, are being addressed in a holistic approach. There is nothing that is important in the life of the human being that Islam did not. Why we call Islam a way of life. It is not religion. 
Islam is not a religion. Islam is a way of life. It is a deen. That's point number one. Therefore, how do we see this subject of Islamic finance as an integral part of our life? It is very clear that the human being, the Muslim or the non-Muslim, wherever you go, you need to take care of your life. Therefore, you are going to be you are going to be dealing with issues, whether you are going to buy or sell, whether you are going to deal with incomes, you are going to deal with doing jobs. Therefore, the financial part is an integral part of your life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us from the beginning that there are certain parts of this that may be haram. There are certain parts of this that may be makruh. And there are certain parts of this that are halal or mubah. Therefore, how do we know which part of this is haram or halal or makruh or mubah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So that's point number one. It is very much integrated in our Muslim life wherever. My second point, how important this is for those of us who are living in a non-Muslim society in the West, where these days the whole world becomes a global village. But living in the eye of the bull that is living in the society that is the Western society, the issue is very much intense, where there is nothing that we do except it is tied to a system. And that system, how much of an influence that it has on us, almost everything. There is nothing that we do. You go and buy a, a, a cup of coffee outside, and if you really analyze your buying of that cup of coffee, you will find that it is very well integrated to that system. And I'm sure the rest is very well known to us. I think my point is this. My point is how that is tied to our identity. That is very much tied to our identity that is not only as Muslims we would like to live in a beautiful, pure, halal system, not only that, but we would like to live it collectively. We would like to live it collectively in a sense where we would like to have institutions. We would like to have our own Muslim way of life in finances, just like there are some institutions that they are trying their best to offer us some alternatives, I am sure if we work harder, we would like to find that is, that is over there in the market that Muslims are involved in it and they don't know. I will end with this last point. If we really are caring about our Muslim identity, in every sphere of life, but in this one too, in finances. We will, we will be maintaining our Muslim identity and actually we will be presenting Islam for those who are not aware of what Islam is in all aspects, including the because Islam has a unique way of life. There is a unique way of life, how to live our life as Muslims, even though what is around us as a system, part of it or many of it may not be, may not be exactly the way we want it to be. I will end with this statement. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa migrated from Mecca to Medina, the people of Mecca, they were people who are used to do trade. They were to jar. They were merchants. They were people of trade. And when they went to Medina, the society of Medina is mainly farmers. But who does, who takes care of the finances of Medina? Who controls the finances of Medina? Anybody can tell me? Yahud, the Jews. So when the Muslims of Mecca went to Medina, soon the dynamics of Medina changed. Because they start introducing ways and soon, little by little, they actually control the market. 
So all those finances, all those kind of borrowing that they used to do, that the Jews of Medina used to control, and the Muslims created their own identity. So they had the market under their own influence, which is something that the, that the Jews did not like. My point is, I am saying as a Muslim community, yes, we can create our own identity. We can really find our ways of how to do that which is halal and avoid that which is haram to the best of our abilities. But that's not left to you or me to decide just based on our own desires, we have to seek the teachings of Allah and His Messenger and the ijtihad of the ulama who are really experts in this field. That's why tonight and tomorrow and Sunday, we have Dr. Ma'an Al-Qudat with us for this weekend and we would like to learn from him, inshallah, and everyone should do his or her best to be here all the time and learn from this beautiful teaching that is dearly needed. Jazakumullah khair wa barakallahu feekum and in your name we welcome our dear brother Dr. Ma'an Al-Qudat with us uh, for this weekend. Jazakumullah khair wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه من ولاه جزاك الله خير شيخ حسام for your beautiful recitation جزاك الله خير شيخ جعفر for your introduction and uh, before I welcome شيخ معن القضاة I would like to welcome everybody here جزاك الله خير for coming جزاك الله خير for making the time you care about knowledge you care about purifying your risk your income may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless you may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless your risk May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your time. Thank you so much for making it. And on behalf of you, brothers and sisters, again, we welcome Sheikh Ma'an al-Qudat. I have planning with him this course for several months. Alhamdulillah, finally, it is happening this uh, weekend for, with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the generosity of Sheikh Ma'an al-Qudat and his uh, accommodations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and reward him. Sheikh Ma'an al-Qudat is of Guidance College in Houston, and he is a member of AMJA, this Council of Fiqh in the uh, United States and North America, that is uh, a Council of Fiqh provides fatwa and guidance, knowledge, especially in the contemporary issues uh, for the Muslim minorities in the West. Sheikh Ma'an al-Qudat is one of their distinguished members. As a matter of fact, uh, when, I, when I call some members in the AMJA and when it is issue related to finance, nobody would answer me. They said, call Sheikh Ma'an al-Qudat. Uh, he is a very distinguished member, and actually every issue of finance that I have face, faced, and it is uh, problematic, Sheikh Ma'an al-Qudat, he is the one who uh, handles and answers these uh, issues. Alhamdulillah, he has spent time, decades, in this field, uh, especially uh, finance, uh, in non-Muslim lands, uh, fiqh al-aqalliyat, uh, fiqh of minorities, fiqh of uh, contemporary issues, and alhamdulillah today we have the right guide, the right scholar to guide us through, throughout this topic inshallah ta'ala. So again, Sheikh Jazakumullah Khair for joining us. We are so delighted, honored to have you in our community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit all of us from this course inshallah ta'ala. Tafadal Sheikh. Inshallah, a few things before Sheikh start. Uh, uh, Brother Hussam shared with you a link to submit the questions. Did you receive it? Okay, for those of you who don't want you to utilize any device, you can write your questions in a piece of paper and send it to me. What I will be doing is, I will be filtering the questions. Every 45 minutes, Sheikh will stop for about 10 minutes or so to answer the questions. So I will be only giving the Sheikh questions that are relevant to the topic. And the questions that I feel they will be covered, inshallah ta'ala, I won't ask. Because so many of your questions may be covered in the next or so. And in the, in the end of the conference, all the questions that are not covered in the topic, it will be uh, answered, inshallah ta'ala, in the last session. So please ask your questions. I will be filtering these questions. But if you feel that your questions is not answered, is, is, it is going to answer sometime, inshallah ta'ala. 
Um, yes, please, brothers and sisters, if you have a gaps, again, the sisters, if you can fill in the gaps, and no raising hands, no interruption, right? Every 45 minutes, there will be break for questions, insha'Allah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Sheikh Ma'an, tafadr. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين اللهم أنا أمسينا منك في نعمة وعافية وستر فأتم علينا نعمتك وعافيتك وسترك في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أمسى بنا من نعمة أو بأحد من خلقك فمنك وحدك لا شريك لك فلك الحمد ولك الشكر يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك رضينا بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا اللهم صل على محمد صلاة تغفر بها ذنوبنا اللهم صل على محمد صلاة تستر بها عيوبنا اللهم صل على محمد صلاة تفرج بها كروبنا اللهم صل على محمد صلاة تحسن بها خاتمتنا اللهم صل على محمد عدد ما ذكره الذاكرون اللهم صل على محمد عدد ما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل على محمد في الأولين اللهم صل على محمد في الآخرين اللهم صل على محمد في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين اللهم آمين أحبتي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبوأتم من الجنة منزلا بإذن الله I know that uh, everybody is excited here or supposedly we are excited because we're going to learn inshallah something uh, maybe relatively new for some of us it's a long topic uh, I'm not sure if you can see everything in my slides here, but I have 390 slides. 390 slides. And I promise, inshallah, if I still alive, stay alive until Sunday evening, inshallah, that I'm going to cover all the 390 slides. I want to just repeat what uh, uh, Sheikh Yasin said. Wallahu alam, the majority of the questions that you have in mind will be answered as we go. Because actually, the, you know, the age of this uh, presentation is more than 20 years. I was having lunch with the Mashaykh today and told them that I started 20 years ago. The very first presentation, it was around maybe 12, 13 slides. And the more I deliver this presentation, the more I learn from my community because I'm not in the industry, I'm not a practitioner, I'm just an academic. So a lot of people actually in the industry, they ask me practical questions. I do not know the answer. I say, La Adri, I go back, I do my own research, I adopt an opinion and I add that a new contemporary issue to the presentation. So it has been inflated from 13 slides to 390 slides. If I'm to come back after two or three years, it's gonna be inshallah around 500, 600 slides inshallah. So do not worry, uh, toward the end of the presentation, the course inshallah, if any of your uh, m m m questions, okay, um, is not answered, let me know. If I have knowledge inshallah, I will be more than happy to uh, address it with you inshallah. As you see in the first slide, very first slide, interest-bearing transactions in the U.S. finance. Interest-bearing transactions in the U.S. finance. So we are discussing المعاملات الريبوية في الولايات المتحدة. معاملات الريبوية في الولايات المتحدة. This actually mandates breaking, breaking down the topic into interest. What does, what does interest mean? When we have heard our Sheikh read in Quran, MashaAllah, اتقوا الله وذروا ما بقي من الربا إن كنتم مؤمنين. What kind of interest we are referring to, right? And riba actually has different, like different types, different kinds. Some of those kinds do not exist nowadays. Muslims, for example, Muslims in the USA in 2022 do not exchange uh, barley for wheat or orange for apple or rice for sugar, right? We just buy and sell and we pay money. Is that correct? So some of those examples about riba are very authentic, do not get me wrong, but they are very irrelevant to our, to our society. Let me start with the, with, the, with the term of Islamic finance. We always hear Islamic finance, Islamic finance. Believe it or not, I don't think it is fair enough 
to call the system Islamic finance to start with. If you decide to call it a Jewish finance, Jewish finance, you are absolutely correct. If you decide to call it a Christian finance, you are absolutely correct. And if you decide to call it Islamic finance, you are absolutely correct. Why? Because the most important component that we have to make sure it does not exist in any transaction, any deal, any partnership, any enterprise, any sharika, any commodity, any deal, any contract, is the riba issue. Is the riba issue. Well, the one who prohibited us, you and I, from dealing with interest is the same one who prohibited the Christian community from dealing with interest. Yes, we do have a, a big question mark when it comes to the authenticity of the Bible, okay? But what is so-called Bible nowadays does have a lot of like verses from Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and Hawariyin prohibiting their followers from dealing with interest. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who prohibited the, the Jewish community from dealing with interest. In the matter of fact, that something has been captured in the Quran itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was, he was criticizing like a certain Jewish community at a certain time. They used to deal with interest while they were prohibited from doing so. So riba, for fact, is haram in our deen, is haram in Christianity, and is haram in Judaism as well. If you decide to call it a divine finance system, you are doing justice to this system because actually it's not like restricted to Islam and Muslims. It is prohibited every time, everywhere. And by the way, all the major prohibited matters in Islam were prohibited in Christianity, were prohibited in Judaism. And all the, all the major ibadat that we practice, Salah, Siyam, Hajj, and Zakah, they were practiced in the previous religions. Right? Salah actually was mandated. Siyam was mandated. Zakah was mandated. Hajj from the lifetime of Ibrahim all the way down until Muhammad وسلم, was mandated. Okay? Just just FYI, if you if you go to uh, if you go to Google image, right? And just type Mary like address. Mary, Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam. Mary like one word, M A R Y, like one word, dress, click. You will be surprised. You will be see a lot of pictures of females who are wearing hijab, right? Which means clearly that Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam was completely muhajib. She was, she was a hijabi, a hijabi woman, right? So even, even the hijab that, mashallah, our sisters are, are, are so proud of putting it on their head, they are not actually bringing something new. This is actually a very common practice in all different, you know, people of faith in Christianity and Judaism, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. Until today in the airports, I, I come across some practicing Jewish people, okay? They are women dressing modestly, almost, almost, close to the hijab of our sisters. So nothing, nothing new here. Islamic finance is the Jewish finance, is the Christian finance, is the divine finance from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one thing. The other thing, I don't think we, uh, we have any issue when it comes to the prohibition of interest. I mean, we all agree that, that riba is haram. Even if you stop like any Muslim guy in the street and ask him or her a question, do you think that Muslims deal in, in, in interest? The answer would be, would be no. Everybody knows that, that we, are, we, are, we are like abandoning or staying away from, from interest. I don't think this is, this is a challenge, okay, whether or not riba is haram. Everybody actually agree that riba is haram. The challenge that we face here, Muslims in the USA, is the identification or the definition of interest that is still implemented in the USA, right? This is number one. And number two, how to navigate through the system and to find out, to find out which one of those contemporary transactions are riba-based to be avoided, and which one actually is riba-free to be conducted freely with no, with no concern. One more time. Definition of riba and the implementation of this definition, how to navigate through the system. As I said in the beginning, if you go to the traditional fiqh books, you read about riba al-fadl and riba al-nasa and riba al nasi I'm going to explain everything, do not worry. Okay? You will read about exchanging uh, date fruit for date fruit, exchanging wheat for barley, exchanging sugar for, for rice. This is riba, it is haram, right? 
uh, exchanging ten dollars for ten dollars. This is riba. I'm sorry, ten dollars for eleven dollars. This is riba. This is haram. But all these different examples do not exist in the real life, right? What we experience is something completely, completely different. So we need to agree on the definition definition of riba that is implemented. Okay, believe it or not, based on my very humble experience, more than ninety-five percent of the interest-bearing transactions in the USA are based on one category of riba, okay, or a very good example of one category of riba, which is riba duyun, the interest-bearing loans, as simple as that. Let me ask you a question. What is the main job of any bank if you, come, if you stop by Bank of America or Chase or Wells Fargo or, or, or Capital One or so on and so forth? What is the, the, the main job of any traditional bank? The job of any traditional bank actually is two different jobs. Number one, what is called the fund mobilization. And number two, the fund, uh, fund mobilization and the fund uh, utilization. Here you go. The fund mobilization and the fund utilization. What does this mean? The bank actually is an intermediator, just a third party. The bank knows that there are a lot of people in the community who do have money and they are sleeping on the money and they are interested in making some money from the money, right? So the bank actually attracts that money, okay, takes that money from those investors and give them like a lump sum or a certain percentage of interest. Give me $10,000 and I'll give you 2% APR, annual percentage rate. Your principal is guaranteed and the return of the principal is guaranteed as well, okay? Now for those Murabeen people who love to deal with interest, it's a, it's a good deal for them. There is no risk whatsoever. You give your $100,000 to the bank and you receive it $102,000 if it is like 1% or 2% every single year. You make some money with no risk, with no liability, uh, nothing whatsoever. So this is the first job, which is to attract the fund of those investors who want to make money from the money without having the headache of getting involved in the business and doing business and taking any risk. Now the second job is the, is the fund utilization. Meanwhile, in the same society, there are a lot of people who are navigating, looking for fund. Someone wants to build a house. Someone wants to uh, buy a car. Someone wants to establish a new business. Someone wants to construct a new hospital to practice like medicine. Someone wants to establish a new business. Someone wants to, want to upgrade his business. So those people actually go to the same bank that already has gotten or received the money from the investors, and he gives them that money with a higher interest rate. So he takes money from the investors for only two or three percent, and he lends the money. He lends the money to those, like you know, traders or business people who are looking for fund, right? Give them the money with with, with five percent interest, and the difference between three and five is two. That is the revenue of the bank, and that's it. That's that, that, that's their job. Banks actually are interest-bearing institutions interest lending and interest bearing institutions. They, they take the money for interest from some people and they give the money to other people with, with interest and they keep the difference between you know, for their own pocket as their own revenue. No risk involved in this business. No risk involved in this, in this business. Back to the, to the interest. What is the category of interest that is agreed upon its prohibition? And again, do not worry, I will go through the slides one by one. This is just an, like a kind of appetizer, like to make sure that, that you, inshallah, you will like the topic. And inshallah, maybe starting tomorrow, I'll, I'll, I'll grill you with the, with the technical details. But tonight, inshallah, we're going like, to zoom out and have an overall understanding of the, of the subject. I want you to look at this slide here. What do you see here? Riba, riba nasiya. Forget about the, the name. Forget about the name. The riba that I'm referring to from now on, whenever I say interest, or I say usury, or I say riba, I refer to this category of riba. It is the premium, the premium. Is it clear, can you see it, everybody? Clear? It is the premium that must be paid, premium must be paid by the, by the borrower to the lender, along with the principal amount, along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. And I want you to memorize this, this definition by, by heart. Okay? Because from now on, I'm going to repeat the word riba 
I'm not going to repeat the definition. So whenever I say riba from now on, I mean the premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. This kind of riba actually is agreed upon its prohibition. There is no madhab in al-madhab al-arba' al-mu'tabar, okay, that has any doubt regarding the prohibition of this kind of riba, which is actually the very straightforward interest-bearing loan, right, that the banks in the United States actually are offering. You stop, bank, you stop by Bank of America, by Chiefs. You apply for investment loan. You apply for a business loan. You apply for a student loan. You apply for personal loan whatever the category might be. You know from day one, from day one, that you are borrowing money, right? And by the agreement between you and the bank, you have to commit yourself to paying the principal back and to pay on top of the principal a certain amount. It could be a lump sum, it could be per day, it could be APR, most probably APR, right? That, that APR, that extra, is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Why riba is haram, that's a completely different discussion. Let's just focus on understanding the technical defi you know, definition of riba. So again, it is the premium that must be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. I want you actually to analyze the, 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 the definition more. So we have a principal versus a premium. Principal actually is the $10,000 that you want to borrow from Bank of America. That's the principal amount, okay? Now, the premium actually is the two APR, okay? Let's say $10,000 for 1% interest. So it has to be paid back like every year, like if you want to keep the money for, for one year, how much you have to pay interest if it is 1% APR, 1%. That's $100, right? Right. If you want to keep the, if you want to keep the money for for two years, so, so you have to pay back the total, like $10,200. Uh, $10, if you want to keep the money for 10 years, okay, if you go with the simple interest, not with the compound interest, that is uh, 10,000 principal, $1,000 interest. Is that correct? So we have a premium and we have a principal amount. And meanwhile, we have a lender and we have a borrower. Right? Someone actually is lending money. Someone actually is having a lot of money relaxed, taking no risk whatsoever, no liability, taking advantage of the need of others, exploiting the society at large, giving them money without taking any risk. And by the FDIC, by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, by the law of the land, by the economic and finance system in the United States, that principle actually is guaranteed, right? So again, you stop by Bank of America, you have your own car dealership business and you're looking for uh, $100,000 to expand or to upgrade your business, right? The bank actually is not getting involved in any kind of partnership with you, right? Um, upon checking, checking your credit, right? Upon approving you, you will be getting $100,000 as a loan. And you are literally by your own. You make a profit, you break even, you incur loss, the bank does not care about you. Because the bank, again, is not initiating any partnership, is not taking any risk from you. Now, this is a very good example for, as a condition for the loan. I'm still actually giving examples of the definition of riba. Premium, already explained, must be paid by the borrower to the lender. So you are the borrower, and Bank of America is the, is the lender, along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan. Condition for the loan means that you know from day one that if you do not agree to pay 1% APR in our example, you are disqualified. You cannot, you can't, I mean, if you tell the guy, the, 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 the loan officer that I'm practicing Muslim, I do not deal with the interest, well, good, good for you, Ma'asalam. You are in the, in the wrong place. If you commit yourself to paying interest, Ahlan Wasalam, sign a, an agreement, take your money, Ma'asalam. But if not, then you are by your own. So you have to pre commit to paying interest. You cannot take that money without paying interest. In other words, interest in this very particular scenario is unavoidable. Interest is unavoidable. You cannot proceed without committing to paying interest. Now, this is a good example for either as a condition for the loan. How about, or for the extension of its maturity? 
Well, that's a completely different, different story. You read, for example, uh, different resources, okay? One of them is Muatta al-Imam Malik, regarding the reason behind the revelation of the ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu, or you who believe, ittaqullaha, be conscious to your Lord, wadharu ma baqiya min al-riba, and quit, okay, or refrain from taking whatever is remaining from interest, if you claim to be believers, in kuntum mu'mineen. فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ If you are not willing to quit, then you are waging a war against Allah and His Messenger. وَإِنْ تُبْتُمْ But if you repent, فَلَكُمْ رُؤُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تَظْلِمُونَ And if you, if you quit, if you repent, then you limit yourself to your principal amount without oppressing others, without being oppressed by others. What was the reason behind the revelation of the ayah? This ayah actually was revealed to permanently permanently prohibit interest from that point ila yawm al-qiyamah, till the day of judgment. Okay. Reason behind it, according to Abdullah ibn Abbas and some other uh, Sahaba radiallahu anhum, قال كان الرجل يقرض الرجل كان الرجل يقرض الرجل فإذا جاء الأجل قال أمهلني وأزيدك People in the Jahiliyyah, even after the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, but before the permanent and the complete prohibition of, of interest, people used to transact with one another by giving an interest-free loan, believe it or not. Interest-free loan, with no interest whatsoever, right? Upon the maturity of the loan, whenever the loan is due, okay, the lender would, would, would approach the borrower by saying, listen, your loan is due. You either pay me now, the principal, you're good to go, no consequences. Or, if you want to take more time, if you are not like able to pay me now, that's fine. I'll give you more time, but you give me more, you give me more, more money, right? إِمَّا إِمَّا أَن تَقْضِي وَإِمَّا أَن تُرْبِي فَإِذَا جَاءَ الْأَجَلْ قَالَ إِمَّا أَن تَقْضِي وَإِمَّا أَن تُرْبِي أَوْ إِذَا جَاءَ الْأَجَلْ قَالَ أَمْهِلْنِي وَأَزِيدُكِ Sometimes, maybe the lender would approach, sorry, the borrower would, would approach the lender by saying, I know that the loan is due, I do not have money. Would it be possible to give me more time? Give me a break, give me more time, and I will pay you more. فأنزل الله سبحانه وتعالى الآية اتقوا الله ودروا بقية من الربا. Now, if the if the if the interest is avoidable, it is still prohibited, but it is less prohibited than less prohibited than taking an interest-bearing loan from Wells Fargo or from Chase. Why? Because in, in the first scenario, the first scenario when you go to Chase, interest actually is unavoidable. Interest is un avoidable. In this scenario, okay, in, in, in the Jahiliyyah, interest is avoidable. And this is actually very connected, very connected, very tight to the use of credit card in the US, right? You can use your own credit card and you have to sign an agreement that in case of cash withdrawal, in case of not paying the, you know, the, the, the full, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, statement, what do you call it, the, the, the monthly statement before the due date, then you commit yourself to paying interest. Okay, what if, what if you did not use your credit card for cash withdrawal? What if you pay the bank statement or the monthly statement in full before the due date, right? Are you still committing river? No, you are not. You agreed to pay interest, but you are not in reality, you are not paying interest, right? So it is less prohibited than the first scenario where you stop by Bank of America and you apply for all because when you go to Bank of America, the interest actually is unavoidable. Interest is unavoidable. When you apply for a credit card or use your credit card, interest actually is avoidable. And actually based on this differentiation, we do have some fiqh rules. I will shall be explaining maybe tonight or tomorrow. Al-haram lidhatihi la tubihu illa al-darura. When something is prohibited for itself by itself. Remember, going to Bank of America applying for a loan. Because it is haram for itself, why? Because riba is unavoidable. You cannot take the money without, without committing to pay interest. You cannot go around the system. You have to pay interest. That's called haram li prohibited for itself by itself. Well, haram li ghayrihi to be hul hajah. If something is prohibited for other causes, quote unquote, using credit card, right? You cannot get your credit card without signing an agreement or, hit, or hitting submit that yes, I'm willing to pay interest in case of one, two, three, four, five. But this, but this does not mean that you are paying interest by default. Okay, you can keep using your credit card for years and years, decades, 
without paying one single interest, one single cent or dollar as an interest. Both are prohibited, but they are not in the same level of prohibition, right? Using credit card, actually, as we shall be explaining, would be permitted because of the public and general need. We live in a society where you cannot function financially well without having credit card. To build your own credit history, to do some, some like daily transactions where using debit card or, or, or like personal check or cashier check or even cash money is not allowed. It has to be credit card. It has to be credit card. So this is just, uh, you know, some, some examples of how to connect the definition of riba with the contemporary transactions that we, that we are facing uh, in the United States. So that is the definition of interest. From now on, whenever I say interest, I mean the premium that must be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. Here is the challenge again. In the real life in the United States, we come across different charges. Sometimes you charge others. Sometimes you find yourself charged by others. Those charges, right, are not introduced to you as interest, riba. They are introduced to you as otherwise. You come across salary, bonus, uh, coupon, uh, penalty, late fees, overdraft charge, overdraft charge, cash back, interest, right? And so on and so forth. And you get confused, late fees, late fees. Is it, is it the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited? Is it included here, the premium that must be paid? And you start thinking and just you know, scratching your head, getting, getting confused, right? Our job, our job actually is to apply this definition and to find out if it is proven, if it is proven that someone is advancing money to somebody else and the recipient of the money is guaranteeing the principal amount and guaranteeing the return while the advancer or the financier or the lender, call him whatever you want, okay, is not taking any risk whatsoever. He is not initiating any partnership, okay, any partnership with the recipient of the money. Oh, that is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Even if it is called otherwise. Even if it is called otherwise. And believe it or not, you will come across some transactions where riba is explicitly mentioned in the agreement, but it's not the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. It is not. And this actually brings to our attention a very crucial, fundamental fiqh maxim or qaida fiqhiyya that I want you again, kindly, I want you to know it by heart. Okay? So the defi definition of riba is known to you all now. The premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. So far, so good. Now, I wanted to add to that this very fundamental fiqh maxim. What matters in transactions is the essence and reality, not the wording or the formality. In Arabic, العبرة في العقود للمقاصد والمعاني لا للألفاظ والمباني العبرة في العقود للمقاصد والمعاني لا للألفاظ والمباني which means in, in a very simple words we do not care about the terms that you use in the agreement sometimes I mean people you know try to uh, tweak or manipulate the contract they remove the word interest they put something else well, excuse me all, we are not that silly. We do not care about the terms that you use in the agreement. What we care about is the essence and the reality of the agreement. If someone actually is giving money to somebody else, and that giver, that financier, right, is not taking any risk whatsoever, principle is guaranteed. A return on the principle is guaranteed as well, right? No partnership, no possibility of risk. That is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Even if they call it musharaka or mudaraba or, uh, okay. Just a very simple example. I'm telling Sheikh uh, Yasin, I will give you this phone as a gift. Okay. No, no, I'm not, I'm not done yet. <laughs> okay. In order for you to gift me back $100. Seriously? I mean, is this a gift? I'll give you the phone as a gift if you gift me back $100. I mean, this is a sale agreement. 
So we just removed the word sale and we put a gift. Okay. Did it change anything in the nature of the agreement? No. It is, I mean, it is a sale agreement, although it is called otherwise. Okay. Let me give you another example. I told Sheikh Yasin again, I'll give you $5,000 as a loan. $5,000 as a loan. Okay. By the beginning of 2023, okay, you pay me back $5,500. Agree, agree, I gave him the money. Now my question to you all, what is the difference between this scenario and me changing my mind, going to Bank of America, opening a saving account? I open a saving account with $5,000, and based on the agreement that 5000 upon the maturity of the saving account after six months or whatever, I'm just giving random examples, do not, do not quote me on that, that Bank of America has to pay me back $5,500. Now, in my deal with Sheikh Yassin, my principal is guaranteed, is that correct? And my return, my return, like the premium on top of the 5,000 is guaranteed. And I don't care about the Sheikh. He wants the money to pay his bills, to do a business, to waste the money. He is absolutely by his own. He makes profit, he breaks even, he loses the principal. I don't care. Deal is deal, business is business. Take 5,000, you pay it back to me, 5,500 after six months from now. What is the difference between this deal and me going to Bank of America, opening a saving account, okay, and asking for that 5,000 to be paid back 5,500 after six months from now? Technically speaking, is there any difference? And this actually brings to our attention that opening a saving account by default, by default, is not a halal option for Muslims. You see? And the point here is that when you open a saving account, it's not introduced to you that, oh, you are lending your money to Bank of America. They do not, like the, the, you know, the, the banker, right, does not look at it this way. But you as a practicing Muslim, you have your own way of interpreting transactions. You need to unlock the secret of the transaction, right? You need to unlock the secret of the transaction. In this, in this, in this example, my principle is guaranteed and the return of the principal actually is guaranteed. Well, that is the interest-bearing loan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. You might say, hold on. Do you want to tell me that I'm lending my money to Bank of America? I have only $5,000, right? And Bank of America has $5 trillion. Do you, do you mean that Bank of America is in need for my 5000 No, the bank does not need your money. You need their service, right? But it doesn't go this way. What we care about is the nature of the agreement. We do not care who needs and who does not need. What we care about is the nature of the agreement. Okay? Your principle is guaranteed by the FDIC again, by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and your return is guaranteed as well. You don't care about Bank of America. If the money is barren, is stolen, you do not care. Okay? You can go after them through the court system and get your principle and get your and get your premium, right? So this brings to our attention that if you are unable to unlock the secret of the transaction, you will be getting lost. Always remember, the premium has to be paid by the lender, by the borrower to the lender, along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. You are giving your 5,000 to Bank of America, Bank of America, guarantees the principal, guarantees the return, whether that return, by the way, is $1 or, or $500, doesn't make any difference. We're talking about the concept itself, right? Oh, that is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Another example. You have in your checking account, you have only $300, right? Available balance. Your checking account is connected with the debit card that you use, am I correct? You stopped by a point of sale and you made a purchase of, you, you purchased an item, you know, for $500. Usually, usually it goes through. Usually it goes through, right? And then when you receive your, your monthly statement, your bank statement, you see that $200 that has to be paid back to Chase, your, like your, your bank. And then, you have to pay $35 over a draft charge. 
Uh oh, it's not interest. It is over overdraft charge. Okay, overdraft. Is the overdraft charge the riba that Allah subhanahu wa taala prohibited or not? Do not do not jump to a conclusion. Okay, take one step back and try to unlock the secret of the transaction. What does it mean that I have only three hundred dollars and I purchased an item for five hundred dollars? It means that I have taken two hundred from a third party. Now, is the is the third party, which is the bank, is giving you two hundred dollars interest free, or you have to pay more than the two hundred? If 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 the only thing you need to pay is the two hundred dollars, then you have no concern. You borrow two hundred dollars, you pay it back, two hundred, right? But the problem here is that no, you have to pay on top of the two hundred something else called overdraft charge. Overdraft charge on top of the principal amount is automatically counted as as interest. Now you can definitely argue that you can say no, this is not interest. This is actual processing fees and overdraft charge because they need to process the information. And you might be correct, but again, the default rule here is that overdraft charge is an interest because you have borrowed money, okay? Because the bank did not give you two hundred dollars. As, as we say in Jordan, no, this is a loan and the loan actually has to be paid back plus that plus by default is is interest based on the definition that, that we repeated maybe seven, eight times so far, payment that has to be paid back, etc, etc. This actually means clearly that you need to check your, your, your bank statement and make sure that you have sufficient fund before you proceed with any, any transaction. A third example, every single utility bill that you receive does have a due date what will happen if you if you do not pay before the due date or oh, there is a late fee or oh, it's not interest it is late fee okay is the late fee the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited or not oh so we start mashallah we have a lot of muftin here so yes yes <laughs> okay take one step back and try to unlock the secret of the transaction. What does it mean that, that I have to pay to uh, Verizon or to uh, T-Mobile $250 a month? What does it mean? It means that I have utilized their service, okay, based on my family plan, my wife and my kids. So I, I utilize their service for one complete month. Toward the end of the month, I owe T-Mobile $250. Now, technically speaking, this is not a loan. It is not, right? It is a debt, right? Because actually I owe T-Mobile $250 because of the service. Now, most of the cases in the Islamic finance system, debt is equivalent to a loan. Debt is equivalent to, we have some exceptions, but debt is equivalent to a loan. So as if I have borrowed $250 from T-Mobile, okay? Because debt is equivalent to a loan, I have to make sure that I pay the outstanding balance 250 before the due date. Otherwise, I will expose myself to paying late fees. If I owe T-Mobile $250 and then I have to pay 270 because of my procrastination, shall I'm going to pay today, tomorrow, until the, the, the due date is already overdue, passed already, then I'm committing riba. That extra five, seven, ten dollars whatever, more or less, is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Although it's not introduced to you as riba, it is introduced to you as late fees. But the late fees actually came based on our own interpretation that this debt is equivalent to a loan, right? And you have to pay more than the loan. Whatever is added on top of the loan will be counted as riba by default. Now, do you see the pattern here? How do you, you know? How do you, how do we like you know process or unlock the secrets of the of the transactions? Let me give you another example. How about mortgaging, mortgaging, uh, mortgaging a home or a house in the USA? Okay. When you say so and so person mortgaged the house, is there any riba involved in it or not? Is it haram or halal? Do not, do not jump to a conclusion. Do not answer. Take one step back and try to unlock the secret of the transaction. That's that's our job. Our job actually is in zarul ahkami. Right? Our job is doing some investigation to break down the transaction and to understand. Okay? We need to keep navigating and just you know, searching. 
if it is proven that someone is giving money to somebody else without taking any risk and the recipient of the money is guaranteeing the principal, is guaranteeing the return, that's the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Now based on that, when you, when you mortgage a house, do you know that you are getting involved in three different simultaneous transactions at the same time? Do you know that? Mortgaging a house means that you are buying a house from the landlord, right? You want to purchase a house for half a million dollars, and the house actually is already there. So you are buying that house from the landlord, right? This is a sale agreement. Now, you do not have half a million dollars to pay cash, so you go to the mortgage company and apply for a mortgage, right? Upon the approval of your application after checking your, your credit history, your income debt ratio, and so on and so forth, if you are approved, the, 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 the mortgage company would issue a check on your behalf payable to the landlord, half a million dollars. That is a loan agreement. Now, in order for the mortgage company to secure their fund and make sure that you will not like ignore transaction, even if you decide like to walk away, or Allah forbid if something happened, you became like insolvent or even you passed away, how can they guarantee their money? They put a lien on the property, they mortgage the property. So we ended up having sale agreement, loan agreement, and a mortgage agreement. We do not have any issue with the sale agreement. We have a serious issue with the loan agreement because actually the, the mortgage company is not giving you an interest-free loan, right? They are not. They are giving you an interest-bearing loan. They pay on your behalf half a million dollars in order for you to pay it back $700,000 within the next 30 years. And if you think that the mortgage company is owning the property because they put their name on the deed of a trust, you are absolutely, with all due respect, you are wrong. Their name is added there as a lien holder, not as an owner. They do not own the house. You are the owner. But in order for them to secure their money, to make sure that if you change your mind or if you pass away or become insolvent or whatever, or you like you know, applied for bankruptcy or you foreclosed, right? They can just go over, over the property through the rahn. Well, the rahn actually is, uh, is fine. We do not have any issue with the rahn. Someone whom I do not know asked me for $100 as a loan from now until Sunday uh, afternoon until I go back to, to Texas. And I told him, okay, I mean, that, that's, I'll give you $100. But with all due respect, I do not know you. Can you please give me your phone or your watch or anything? Keep it with me. Whenever you come back with the $100, I will pay you, I will give you back, you know, your watch. Is there anything wrong with that? Okay. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ وَلَمْ تَجِدُوا كَاتِبًا فَرِهَانٌ مَقْبُوضًا Rihan actually, according to the Quranic terminology, a rihan actually is the mortgage. Okay. A rihan is the mortgage, which is, which is the collateral that you ask to take from the borrower to secure your, your, your fund, your money. We do not have an issue with that. So we do not have an issue with the, with the rahan, with the mortgage. We do not have any issue with the sale agreement. We have a lot of issues with the loan agreement. Now we ended up having three different simultaneous transactions together. Sale agreement, loan agreement, interest bearing loan agreement, and a mortgage agreement. If you want to be like a very democratic and you want to go with the majority, you can say, okay, we have two halal transactions versus one, right? So everything is halal. Well, unfortunately, in the Islamic finance system, it goes the other way around. If it is proven that one deal, one deal, including different deals, is absolutely prohibited, that haram deal is more than enough to ruin the whole deal and to make it, to make it haram. Now, because of the interest-bearing loan involved, right, the whole deal actually is not, is not an option. So by default, by default, mortgaging a house in a traditional way in the USA is not a halal option. Now, do not tell me the Haja and the Rura and the Islamic finance company. I mean, that's a completely different discussion. We're here tonight to establish some basic rules and to establish a process, how to think accordingly, how to be able to follow the pattern. Do not jump to a conclusion. You need to pause, take one step back, investigate, scrutinize, and find out. Okay, if you can, if you can find out, if you can deduct someone giving money to somebody else without taking any risk, any risk whatsoever, and the principal is guaranteed, and the return on top of the principal or the premium, right, or the premium on top of the principal is guaranteed, 
That is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Whether it is called riba or interest, overdraft charge, bonus, commission, penalty, call it whatever you want. We do not care about the names. We care about the essence and the nature of the, of the agreement. العبره في العقود للمقاصد والمعاني للالفاظ والمباني. More examples. How about the cash back? You have a credit card, right? And you, uh, you purchase items for $100. And the cash back actually is 5%. So every single $100 that you pay, right, using your credit card, you will be getting $5 back. Am I correct? Okay. Is it, is it haram to take the cash back? I want to hear someone saying say yes or no. <laughs> MashaAllah. So we still have a lot of muftin here. Okay. طيب, before we jump to a conclusion, okay, again, you need to pause and go back and think about it. What does it mean? What does it mean to hold a credit card? What does it mean? It means that you are authorized to borrow money from the credit card company. You do not have a checking account where you deposited 5,000 halal cash money and you are using your debit card to withdraw from it remotely. No, it's not the case. You are borrowing money from someone. So all the rules and the restrictions of the loan agreement apply here. Am I correct? Now, you borrow $100. You borrow $100. If you have to pay it back 105, then you are paying interest. If you, as a borrower, have to pay it back $105, more or less, then you are paying interest. But the outcome result is that you pay $100, I'm sorry, you borrow $100, right? And you get $5 back, cash back. The net amount that you pay is how much? A cent, 95. So you borrow more and you pay less. The cash back actually is the complete, is the complete opposite of, of interest. Because actually the interest is كل قرض جر نفعا للمقرض فهو ربا. كل قرض جر نفعا للمقرض فهو ربا. Every single loan that brings a stipulated, stipulated benefit to the lender will be counted as riba. Slow motion. Every loan that brings a stipulated benefit to the lender. Okay. Now, who is the lender here? Chase. Is Chase benefiting or you, the borrower, is the one who is benefiting? The borrower actually is the one who is benefiting. So, at the end of the day, you borrow $100 you borrow $100 and you pay it back $95. So you are the beneficiary, right? You are the one who is benefiting from the loan and not the lender. So cash back actually is the opposite of riba and thus it is, it is halal. Who said it is halal here? Who said it's halal? I'm gonna give you a gift. Oh, mashallah, jazakallah khair. No. What's that? He said, I wash your video. Oh, your so he was cheating, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, one, one more example. I think it's time to open the floor for question and answer. One more example. You want to, you want to buy a car, owner finance, owner finance, from your non-Muslim neighbor, John Smith. John actually is asking for $10,000, $10,000 cash for the car and you're interested in the car, you checked like the market value, you went to a KPB or uh, what else, like uh, CarMax, and you found out that yes, the market value of the car is $10,000. But the problem here is that you do not have $10,000. And you, you said, you know, John, I do not have 10000 to pay you. Is it an option for you to make an installment for me? To make an installment for me, right? He said, yeah, it's gonna be $2,000 interest, interest and ten thousand dollars principal because the market value is ten thousand so if you want to make an installment with me right for two years oh, i'm sorry for for one year right it's going to be twelve thousand dollars installment okay and you said well i do not pay interest you said well it is it is what it is you take it or you leave it if you want to buy my car i'm going to write in the agreement ten thousand dollars price plus two thousand dollars interest so the total will be $12,000, right? Is this the interest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited? <laughs> if, you, if, you think, if you think the transaction is haram, 
and those $2,000 are interest. Raise your hand. Do not act, act as if you are like, you know, scratching your head. It's either yes or no. R raise your hand. Half, half. Half, half. Fine. If you think that those, that this transaction actually is halal, and those $2,000 are not riba, raise your hand. Yes or no? No? Fine. Actually, some brother and sister did not raise their hand like either. <laughs> anyway. Again, pause and, and just take one step back and try to find out what's going on. Now, the market value of the car is how much? $10,000. Does John Smith have the right, from an Islamic perspective, to ask for $12,000 cash for the car? Yes. I mean, here is what I have. You take it or you leave it. There is a lot of transparency in the market. There is no monopoly. He's not monopolizing the car, right? If you think that the car is too expensive or he is like inflating the price, just leave him alone and, and, and find somewhere else. So he does have the right to ask for $12,000 cash for a car that does not, that is not worth more than 10000 Well, if he has the right to charge you, okay, $12,000 for a car that worth only $10,000, why cannot he break down those $12,000 in one year? Why not? If he is okay to charge you $12,000 cash, Okay, and he wants to make you a favor by just breaking down those $12,000 in one year. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Number two, this is a sale agreement. You are not borrowing money. If and only if you told John Smith, hold a second, and you went to uh, Wells Fargo, and you borrowed $10,000, you paid cash to John Smith, and then you paid Wells Fargo, $12,000 in one year, will it be still halal? No, why? Because there is ahsan, because there is a loan agreement involved here. But in the first scenario, it was an owner finance between you and John Smith. So although he wrote down $10,000 price, $2,000 interest, well, that is not the interest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. It is not. It is not. So even if it is written in the agreement, it is still halal. It is still halal. You contracted a construction company, okay, to build a house for you. And that house actually has to be finished, has to be finished by December 31st, 2022, right? And you made a deal with the apartment that you're going to relocate, you're going to just evacuate and go to the new house, okay? And, and you wrote in the, in, the, in the agreement with the construction company a penalty that if you do not submit me the key by the end of the year, I'm going to charge you $200 every single day because I will be incurring loss. I'm, I'm going to pay. I'm going to rent the apartment day by day. Is there anything wrong with that? Is this counted as, as interest? No, it is not. You are, well, basically, there is no loan agreement. This is, a, this is called a manufacturer sale, right? Manufacturer, aqdu Okay, You give him money, and he builds a house for you, right? There is no loan agreement. This is completely different transaction that has nothing to do with loan. So charging him $200 a day because of being late and submitting you the key would be, would be fine. Although, I mean, you charge him apparently interest. Well, there is no interest. An example actually can go on and on and on. Now, do you all see the pattern? How can we like go through those different transactions and find out which of those deals, transactions, enterprise, uh, entrep entrepreneurship, w w whatever, partnership, contract, agreement, whatever, right? Do you, uh, I mean, do you see it now clearly? How can we navigate through it and find out if someone is charging or g giving money and the money actually is guaranteed and the return on that money is guaranteed without taking any risk, okay? If that is approved, then that is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. Okay. Is, it, is it time to... Yeah, just go ahead, brother Khal. Go ahead. We do, not, we do not need to complicate the issue, my brother. 
it, it's very simple. You borrow one hundred dollars, you pay it back ninety five because you already generated five dollars uh, cash back. As simple as that. Okay. It has nothing to do, nothing to do with it or not. The lender is benefiting some way, somehow from somebody else. It's very simple. It's a relationship between you as a borrower with the lender. Very simple. You borrowed one hundred. You pay it back 95. You are paying less than what you have borrowed. And as I always say, if you have any issue with the cash back that you have, give it to me. I will, I'll be sure more than happy to take it. Yeah. Uh, I just would like to say something. If you have any question, again, either you submit them uh, remotely uh, or you write or you write them in a piece of paper. So because I have to filter them, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we have a lot of questions, Sheikh. But before I ask questions, I have a question. Uh, you touch upon saving account, late fees, student loan, uh, uh, late fees. Are you going to cover them in the, because so many questions is related to this. So we don't have to ask the questions about all these topics. Yes. Because you will be covering them. Yeah. As I said, I mean, this, this long introduction is just a kind of appetizer to give you like a taste of, of what's going on. Right? I like to open your appetite for tomorrow's inshallah session. Uh, I, I do have a very boring actually session here that I'm going to start, inshallah, soon, which is the very fundamental rules of, of riba, definitions of riba. It's very, very rough, very uh, dry, not that interesting whatsoever, but it is very, very important. I mean, we have to go through them slide by slide. We need to know the difference between riba al-fadl and riba al-nasa and riba al nasiya because without, like, mastering those definitions, we cannot go any further. So I, I really appreciate your patience for maybe half an hour, I'm going to grill you with this boring information, and you need to master them. If, if not, then whatever I'll be explaining tomorrow is going to be hard for us to you know, catch up. Because, I mean, this is the foundation. This is the fiqh rules of riba that, inshallah, will be explained uh, tonight, hopefully, inshallah, if we have time. Yes, uh, inshallah ta'ala. The first question, Sheikh, I don't, I don't think it's coming, so I will ask this question. You, the, you mentioned, for example, somebody borrowing money. You come to me, get $5,000. I say, okay, I will give you $5,000 with the interest of $500 uh, when you pay back. So if it is between two consenting adults willingly and uh, you need my money, I am making profit. So why is it haram? So the concept is, where is the, the, where is the, the, the gharar or the darar in prohibition of riba? So why, basically, why riba is haram? That's a very good question. In, in, in most cases, most cases, it's a win-win situation. You go to Bank of America, you borrow half a million dollars, you establish your own business, you pay them back the principal and a 3% interest. You make 10, 15, 20% profit, you pay the principal and the interest, and you keep the rest for yourself. Everybody is happy. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibiting riba? Right? Well, you did not take into consideration the, the, the severe examples, the extreme examples. It does happen every now and then, and I, you know, I'm responsible for what I say, that sometimes you do not make 10% profit or 20, you do not make 100%, you make 10,000% net profit. Can you believe that? A friend of mine in Houston, Texas, is a wholesaler. He told me, he said that I bring excuse me, all, like a, a useless pants from somewhere in the world, useless, almost a trash, excuse me all. And I just bring them, I process them, and, and I clean them, right? And I, I pay out of pocket $1 per pants, $1. And I sell it for $100. I sell it for 100 So every single dollar he pays out of pocket, he gets it back how much? $100. So he makes maybe 10,000% profit. Just imagine that this brother actually is borrowing money. I mean, alhamdulillah, he's a very practicing, mashallah, away from riba. Imagine that someone is borrowing money from Bank of America. Is it fair enough for the bank to take only 3% of the profit or 5% while you are making 100%, 1,000%, 10,000? Absolutely, it is, not, it is not fair. So there is an extreme exploitation, right? And taking advantage of the bank if you are making too much profit. Now, the other extreme example, okay, those people who borrowed money back in March 2020, just a few days before the pandemic, the COVID-19, started hitting the, the economy in the, in the USA. 
and the whole actually country was just frozen for maybe two or three months. Now those people who borrowed money from Bank of America and Chase, okay, the bank actually by, by the law of the land, by, by default, does have the right to go after them, right? And those people, by the way, with no negligence, with no carelessness from their side, because, because of the bad economy, right, because of the recession that happened, they were unable to make a profit whatsoever. They were unable to break even. They were unable even to survive. They lost the principal. The principal actually is gone, right? The bank actually does not care about them. Again, by the law of the land, the bank does have the right to go after them, asking for the principal and for the interest on top of it. Well, where is, where is the justice here? Where is the justice here? So there is a lot of injustice in the, in the, in the right side, in the extreme like in you know, right example, and there's a lot of injustice in the right and you know, in, in, in the, in the left extreme example. My point here is that whenever riba is implemented in any society, it brings a lot of financial injustice and exploitation. Exploitation in a very technical term, Sheikh Yasin, we call this this model. We call it a risk risk shifting model. Risk shifting model. Someone actually is putting the risk on the shoulder of the other party. The bank is just relaxing, making money, right? Taking no responsibility whatsoever, does not produce anything, does not buy, does not sell, does not produce, does not do anything whatsoever, just lends money and extracts money from the money without adding any value to the society. And the whole risk and responsibility and liability is on the shoulder of the of the borrower. In the Islamic finance system, just imagine that we do have an Islamic finance system implemented and you went to Bank of America, to Islamic Bank of America, applying for a half a million dollars loan. They would say, well, sorry, we do not give you money. You are in the, in the, wrong, in the wrong place. Because in the Islamic finance system, loan is not a mode of finance, believe it or not. Loan is not a mode of finance, right? If you, if you, if you want to have half a million dollars Right. Well, let me give you another example. Someone actually approached me, asked uh, ask me for uh, $100,000 as a loan. If I know, if I know for sure that he wants that money, he wants that money to pay his bills or to do a surgery, for example, or to pay for, for the tuition fees or to provide food for his kids, I'll be shallow, more than happy to give him the money if I have it, right? Because actually in the Islamic finance system, Loan is not a mode of finance. It is a kind of devotion. It's a kind of cooperation. It's a kind of sadaqah, believe it or not. If you lend your money twice, according to the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, you will be counted as if you have given up that money. You see? So loan actually is an act of charity. You give someone in a desperate need for money, give him whatever amount, and you take the whole package because you are a practicing Muslim. You take even the, you know, the inflation, even if he pays you back, after one year and the inflation was two or three percent, you take that loss because you seek nothing more than the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if somebody else actually came to me and asked for my one hundred thousand dollars as a loan, I know for a fact that this guy does have a, a car dealership or accessory store or grocery store. Is it is it fair enough for me to give him my money as an interest free loan for one complete year? And he takes my 100,000, making money, upgrading his business, and then coming back to me after one year with a big hug, Jazakallah wa khairan, here is your 100,000 dollars. Seriously? I mean, why should you take my money and you make money from my money and you give me my money as is? I mean, is it, is it fair enough? No, it is not. It is not. If you want my 100,000 dollars, okay, for business people, well, let's sit down and talk business. I sit down and talk with we have a several we have a several Islamic modes of finance okay so none of them none of them but does have a certain amount of risk that the financier okay or the bank or the finance system or the mortgage company does take a certain amount of risk liability right liability in order for them to justify the profit that they are looking for and by the way, we are not like coming up with those rules out of our own mind. I mean, this is the exact hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said in a very precise, subhanAllah, very precise hadith, very concise, straightforward to the point. He said, Al-Kharaju Bid-Daman. Al-Kharaju Bid-Daman. Prophet, 
follows liability. Al Kharaju Buddhaman. Profit follows liability. If you want to make a profit from the money that you have, Ahlan wa Sahl, we would love to see you flourishing with your business, but do it the right way. You need to get involved in actual real business. Okay? I'll give you just a, a very simple example. Uh, I always actually mention this example. We have two brothers. We have Muhammad and Abdullah. Two brothers. And they both actually want to finance their own house. Muhammad actually applied, Muhammad applied for Bank of America, and, and Abdullah applied for an Islamic mortgage company. I want you just to imagine, imagine that there is a genuine and sound and authentic enough Islamic finance practice, which is unfortunately not the case, by the way. There's nothing called like Islamic finance practice, a genuine and sound one. Illa, yani illa ma rahim rabbi. Just imagine that we do have it, right? Muhammad was approved for half a million dollars with Bank of America, and Abdullah was approved for half a million dollars with the Islamic Mortgage Company. Okay? Muhammad purchased his house, and Abdullah did the same. Someone actually is passing by and has no idea of what's going on. He would say, well, what is, what is the difference? Muhammad borrowed half a million dollars, and he has to pay it back $800,000 within 30 years. Within 30 years. And Abdullah did the same. Abdullah was approved for half a million dollars loan, according to him, and he has to pay it back $800,000 within 30 years. What's the difference? That's a very good question. This kind of confusion, confusion, misunderstanding of the difference is not something new. It was actually raised a while ago during the, you know, the revelation of the Quran itself. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الْرِبَى وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَى some people said that sale agreement is like a loan agreement where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted, permitted the sale agreement and he prohibited the loan agreement. Do you know what is the difference here? Muhammad, the one who went with Bank of America, he borrowed half a million dollars as a loan and the bank actually is not responsible for the outcome result of that loan. Muhammad actually was by his own. If there is any appreciation or depreciation or damage or tax or maintenance or insurance, or foreclosure, or what else, imminent domain, or national disaster, he is absolutely by his own. Bank actually does not care about him. Abdullah is absolutely different story. Abdullah initiated what's called the diminishing partnership, or declining partnership between him and the mortgage company. He paid only 5%, like Muhammad. Muhammad paid down, uh, uh, down payment. Abdullah paid down, down payment only 5% to establish an equity, okay? And the Islamic Mortgage Company actually came on board and they purchased the property jointly with, Muhammad, with, uh, sorry, with Abdullah. So we ended up having 95% owned by the mortgage company, Islamic Mortgage Company, 5% owned by whom? By Abdullah. It is an actual, genuine, sound partnership. Now based on that, Abdullah is willing to occupy the property exclusively along with his family members. So is it fair enough for him to pay rent or lease to the mortgage company? Yes, I mean, they own 95% of the house and he owns only 5%, right? So upon like, you know, doing the, you know, the, their math, if the, if the fair rental value, fair rental value is $2,000, then he has to pay them $2,500 every month. $500 every month to increase his equity in the property. $2,000 go toward the the, the, the rent. And then after that, maybe $505 $5 will go equity, $2,000 minus $5 will go to the rent because actually he's owning shares, right? Now, after one or two months, he becomes 6% owner. And the ownership of the mortgage company goes down to 94, 7%, 93, 8%, all the way until in, in, the, in, in the last payment after 30 years, he kicks them out of the deal by becoming the exclusive, that, that's why they call it diminishing partnership. During this long-term agreement, believe it or not, tax, maintenance, maintenance, I mean the ma like major maintenance expenses, not the wear and tear, has to be, has to be incurred proportionally, proportionally between Abdullah and the mortgage company. If he owns 10% of the property after two years, right, 10%, and the tax actually is 10,000, then he has to pay only 
1,000 if he's 10 percent, and 9,000 has to be paid by the mortgage company. Maintenance is the same. Insurance is the same. Not only that, if he decides one day to terminate the agreement, that's absolutely up to him because aqdul aqdul sharaka, aqdun jaz, or aqdun wajib. So he wants I mean, just to get rid of that partnership. That's fine. Put the house in the market. If there is any appreciation, appreciation, a profit, and he owns, let's say, 50% of the house after 15 years. If there is an appreciation, like increase in the market value, $100,000, he's entitled to take 50,000, and the mortgage company takes 50,000. And vice versa, if, if there was a depreciation, 100,000, he incurs only 50,000, and they incur 50,000. If there is a natural disaster and the insurance did not cover it, he incurs 50% of the loss. If there is any imminent domain, for example, house is taken by the Baladi or by the you know, county or the city or the federal government for whatever reason, and they did not compensate them well, and there was a loss, it has to be shared between them proportionally based on the, based on the percentage of, of ownership. None of the above, none of the above applies with, with Muhammad because he actually took a loan. See the difference? ذلك بأنهم قالوا إنما البيع مثل الربا وأحل الله البيع وحرم الربا. Every single mode of finance, if it is applied genuinely, soundly, it has to show a certain amount of risk. And the best option when it comes to owning houses is a diminishing partnership, because it is a real, genuine, sound, long-term partnership, right? This is called risk-sharing model versus the first one, which was risk-shifting model. Risk shifting model is the traditional finance system. You just put the load and the liability and the risk on the shoulder of the borrower. You are by your own. In the risk sharing model, which is the nidam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay, it does not have risk shifting. It has risk sharing model. If there is a profit, everybody makes profit. Everybody is happy. If there is a loss, everybody actually will be incurring the loss accordingly. And that's the justice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, you know, the whole people, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, to implement. Subhanallah, if you read in Surah Al-Hadid, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ We sent our prophets with the clear message. وَأَنْزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ We sent with them Al-Kitab, which is the book or the scripture, and the Mizan, the scale. Why? قَالْ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ Subhanallah. The main reason behind sending prophets and messengers to humanity is to apply Justice. It's all about justice. So the prohibition of riba when it comes to transaction is the only way where you can eliminate that, that injustice, where you can enforce justice on people. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited riba. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for this comprehensive answer. Uh, there, are, there are so many questions. There are so many questions, brothers, about, again, about leasing, about saving account, late fees, stocks, market, student loans, 401k. So many questions. It's going to be covered in details in the next couple of days. Here's a question, Sheikh, about inflation rate versus riba interest. If it's not coming, can you elaborate more? Inflation it is coming, rate. Is it coming? Oh, yeah. Okay. So inflation rate is coming. Then I think a lot of questions, but all of them will be covered. You can proceed, Sheikh. Yeah, can you, I will allow you to ask questions, but you are the last one. Everybody must ask questions through two ways. Write it in a piece of paper or submit this digitally. So I can filter them and ask them in the right timing. But please go ahead, brother. Did you understand the question? Can you re uh, can uh, re ask your questions? For, for for the Islamic financing companies, you are saying. So so he's asking basically Islamic financing companies. They are borrowing money from other banks, basically, right? This is what you are asking. So they are part of the the system, riba system, even if they are. Sorry. Is this your question, brother? 
Okay. Sheikh, okay. Let me give you like a, a general answer. General answer. Not, not. Can I? So the question basically, if you are going to Islamic financing company, even if the aqd, the contract, supposedly is halal, right? Because it is partnership, not loan with riba. But the Islamic financing company, it's getting funds from bigger banks with riba. So what's the point of having a contract with them if they are getting their fund from bigger banks and banks who deals with riba? This is the question. Here is, here is the answer, Akhil Karim, in general, regardless of the Islamic mortgage companies. As our Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Jafar said, that the Jewish community in Medina were dealing with interest. Is that correct? طيب, let me ask you all this, this question. Did the Prophet والسلام, transact with the Jewish community buying and selling in Al Medina? Yes, he did. Can you show me any evidence, authentic, acceptable, weak narration, that the Prophet والسلام, refrained from proceeding with any transaction until he asked the Jewish guy, where did you get your money from? Is your money coming from riba or not? Can you show me any hadith in the authentic sunnah? Accepted hadith, hadith sahih, hadith da'if, hadith hasan. The Prophet وسلم, investigated or stopped any transaction until he did further investigation. Where did the other party, contracting party, get the money from? To my knowledge, there is nothing in the sunnah like this. W what is the message here? The message here is very simple. You need to draw a line between the soundness and the permissibility of the deal between you and the other party versus where did he get the money from, right? With very, very, very few exceptions, to be honest with you. If you know, for example, that this money is a stolen money, someone like stole the money or embezzled the money or uh, uh, extorted, like you know, took the money by, you know, by force, ghasman, from someone and, he came, and you are positive that this is stolen, or embezzled money, then you cannot take that money. But otherwise, otherwise, you are not responsible for the permissibility of the resource, of the income, of the other party that you are dealing with. You are not. I would, I would assume, I would assume that all these, just for discussion purposes, that all these so-called Islamic mortgage companies, their business actually is, is, is not that well. That. Their mode of finance is Islamically acceptable. I mean, just for discussion purposes. If you agree with me that XYZ Islamic mortgage company is halal enough, right? Then you should not care about where did they get their money from. Should not. That's completely different, different discussion. Now, in the real life here, in the real life, did you come across any masjid in the United States whenever they do a fundraising, okay? And people start raising hands. Do they ask you, Akhi, where did you get your money from? Do you have a liquor store? Do you have a gas station? Do you have a, you know, I mean, do we usually do that in the message, Sheikh Yassin? Okay. Although we might know that, that, that not every single individual in the community has a pure halal income. But is it our job and responsibility to investigate and not to take money from those people who do not have halal income? Is it, I mean, is it our job? That's absolutely irrelevant, irrelevant to the to the discussion. Now, what we discuss is the permissibility and the soundness of the deal that you sign with the Islamic mortgage company to answer the question. Where did they get their money from? That's completely different, diff different discussion. Sheikh, follow up on this point. You said except few uh, exceptions. So somebody, if you know somebody who is in pure haram business, like somebody, God forbid, in in adultery business or something pure haram and having transactions with you but transaction is halal like coming to you to buy your phone but you know for sure that the person having pure haram income not like a bank or a business where it's a mix of so a variety of transactions is it halal to have because you don't care where the money is coming from is it halal to have transaction with this person knowing that not percentage of his income purely Haram income. Is it halal? There is a, 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 a well established qaida fiqhiyya, Sheikh Yasin. Al haram ula yantakilu ila dhimmatain. Al haram ula yantakilu ila dhimmatain. 
the, the, the prohibition status is not transferable from one individual to another. It is not. You read in Sahih al-Bukhari, for example, that the Prophet ﷺ once passed by the, the house of Barira, radiallahu anha. Barira actually was a slave girl of Aisha, radiallahu anha. Barira was a slave girl of Aisha, radiallahu anha. And she was cooking meat. She was cooking meat. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Barira to serve him some meat to eat. She said, Ya Rasulullah, innahu min as-sadaqa. Innahu min as-sadaqa. It is, it is a kind of donation and charity. Why she said that? Because Prophet Sallallahu does not take sadaqah, mashallah, like Ahsan. Prophet Sallallahu was allowed to take the hadiyya, not a sadaqah, a gift, he takes it. Because if it's like very special, you know, you know, prestigious status as the Prophet, he was prohibited from taking sadaqah. But he was allowed to take hadiyya gift. Qala ya barira, huwa laki sadaqah, wa lana hadiyya, mashallah, like. Now, for you, when, when you have received the meat, it was sadaqah for you as a slave girl. But whenever you serve the meat to me, it's not a sadaqah anymore, it is, it is a hadiyah. And that's why our, our ulama, our fuqaha said, al-haram la yantaqilu ila dhimmatayn. Okay? The prohibition status is not transferable from one individual to another. We're going to come across a lot of examples tomorrow, Sheikh Yaseen, on inheriting haram money. Mm-hmm. My dad passed away while having haram business. I did not support him, I did not agree with him, I did not help him in doing that, halal, that haram business, and then he passed away. Can I inherit that money or not? Yes, I can. I can. Because actually, I'm the legal heir of my dad. I'm just giving an example. Alhamdulillah, my dad was not dealing with haram. Just an example. Uh, because he is responsible for whatever he has done during his lifetime. Alayhi al ghurm I mean, there is no owner of the money except for me and my mom and my siblings. Right? If I was supporting him and helping him and approving what he does, then I'm sharing the sin with him. That's a completely different story. But if he has done something out of his own mind, without taking my, my permission, and then he passed away, then actually he takes the sin, and I take the money. You see? As simple as that. No. There are some questions about the mortgage. The Muslim mortgage is a higher rate than it's coming, inshallah ta'ala. The one last question, Sheikh, before we proceed. There is a person asking about فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The ayah in the Quran al kareem The question is, is the person who is borrowing the money is as severe, as haram, as as filthy and ugly as the lender who is the recipient of, of the interest. Like, is the ayah talking about the recipient, which is فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ or even the person who is uh, giving uh, the, the, the interest? Here is, here is the answer. Jab radiallahu anhu reported, Allah's Messenger وسلم, cares the acceptor of interest. Akil riba the eater, right? Acceptor of, of interest. And it's payers, like the one who pays it. And the, and the one who records it, وكاتبه, the script. وشاهدي, and the two witnesses. So the one actually who consumes the riba is cursed. And the one who pays riba to others is cursed. And the one who writes down and facilitates the transaction is cursed. And the two witnesses who facilitate the transaction are cursed. And if somebody still has some doubt, okay, regarding that differentiation between consuming versus paying interest, he said, قَالَ وَهُمْ سَوَى They are equal in committing the sin. So the one actually who consumes riba and the one who eats riba are the same when it comes to, when it comes to haram. However, to be fair, in most cases, 99.9%, there is no necessity, there is no necessity that pushes you to consume interest, right? I mean, there is no situation, 99.9%, that you are in, 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 a necessary, in a necessity situation where you have no choice but to consume or to eat riba. However, you might find yourself in a position where you have to borrow money with interest. Someone actually is running out of resources and about to be kicked out from his apartment because he did not pay the rent. He tried to find like Islamic mortgage in no way interest-free loan from a Muslim brother or sister, no way whatsoever. And he was about to be kicked out of his apartment. Can he go to the closest bank and apply for an interest-bearing loan just, I mean, to survive and to stay in his apartment? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. So this is, this is actually one of the differences, well, maybe the major difference, that a necessity might happen, necessity might happen to push you or to enforce you to borrow money with interest. 
and there is no sin upon you. If you are in a darura, فَمَنَ الطُّرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفِ لِإِثْمٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورًا فَمَنَ الطُّرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ So there might be a possibility of you to be desperate for borrowing money with interest. But there is no way for you to be in desperate need to lend money with interest. That's the difference. Did I answer? Yes, okay. yes. Jazakallah khair. I, again, I, I said this last question, but there is another question here. I think the answer is very simple, but again, I have to ask it. If I lend $5,000 to my friend with an agreement that it says you will pay me $5,000 plus $1,000, which is total of $6,000, is that haram over one year? A loan of one year. Yeah, if it is, if it is a loan, like yes, there is this no is said, Lend 5,000, which is a loan. That's, that's a straightforward interest bearing home. So it's a pretty straightforward riba and haram. Yeah, uh, the, he's saying about inflation. So the inflation is coming tomorrow, right? So the inflation, we'll talk about it tomorrow, inshallah. Ta'ala. We have 15 minutes and see Salat al Isha. We pray Salat al Isha and then we'll continue after Salat al Isha for about half an hour. Or so, for the chair. Uh, as I said, it's going to take us between 30 minutes to 45 minutes. This is actually a very rough and tough and, and boring information, but actually, we have no choice but to pay attention and to comprehend what I'll be saying. Because if we master these fundamental fiqh rules of riba and understand it very well, we can navigate through the system easily tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. If we don't understand it well, then, wallahu alam, I mean, like comprehending the rest of the presentation might be challenging for us. So, thank you in advance for your patience. Bye. Interest in the balance of Sharia. This is the hadith that I just uh, uh, shared with you that every single individual involved in riba, whether the, whether the consumer or the payer or the script, like the writer or the witnesses, the two witnesses, whosoever facilitate. Riba transaction actually is involved in the la'na and the cares of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the cares of his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Being involved in riba is among the, uh, among the seven destructive major sins. Major sin. SubhanAllah, if you read the whole Quran from the beginning until the end, you will never find the masiya or sin where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is declaring war against those who are involved in other than the sin of being involved in riba. فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ and outside the Quran and the Hadith and Hadith Qudsi, Man Adali Waliyan Fakad Adan to Hubilhar. Whosoever shows an animosity and hostility to a Wali, like a close devout to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah Azza wa Jal is waging a war against him. But in the Quran itself, the only sin where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waging war against those who are involved in actually is riba. For those who are writing notes about what I'm, what I'm explaining, you don't have to. The PowerPoint presentation is not copyrighted. It is not. It is for everybody. I send it to the Mashaykh several times. Please feel free to take your own copy, forward it, save it, send it to everybody. It is just sadaqah tunjari, inshallah. Uh, we will share it with everybody. Unless like, you know, like there are certain issues, you know, are not mentioned in the presentation, you want to take note, that would be fine. So the Prophet was, was asked about, uh, okay, well, he said, avoid the seven destructive major sins. What are those? He said, Al Ishraqu billah have parts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until he said, one of them, eating of usury. And that's a confusing part. Wa riba. And in the Quran, la ta'kulu riba adhafa mudafa. Some people think that, oh, consuming riba okay, is prohibited for itself. Paying riba to others is prohibited for other causes. That's, that's wrong. That's wrong. Both of them are prohibited, and here is the evidence. Wa qala hum sawa. So you need to combine, you need to consolidate, if you wish, all the evidences in this regard to come up with a proper conclusion. Every single individual directly involved in riba, uh, lending, borrowing, documenting, witnessing, facilitating, is included in the cares and the la'na of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet sallallahu Technically speaking, there might be some necessities that push you, mandates you to borrow one with interest. And if you are in the state of necessity, then there is no blame on you because, because you are mutar. But there is no situation where you find yourself actually imposed against your will to take riba from other people. You cannot, with very, very few exceptions. Okay? One of those exceptions, by the way, subhanAllah, a few weeks ago, 
you have received a, a question to the fatwa committee. An old lady in Egypt, in the Amja, Amja fatwa committee, old lady in, in Egypt, uh, 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 and she's a, a widow, and she has a lot of kids. She inherited a good amount of money. She does not know how to do business. She does not have a business mentality. She doesn't know like a good trustworthy individual to get involved with him or with her in mudarab or musharak or halal business. She was asking a question. Can I open a saving account and get a fixed return from the bank? And this is the only source of income for me, period. If I do not take this action, all the principal amount will be just, will be gone. And I said, subhanallah, wallahi, this is the very first time. I'm now 53 years old. This is the very first time in my life I come across a question, okay, where, where, where a person might be in desperate need, desperate need to? To eat riba, subhanallah. I did not give her like, a, like an official answer, but my recommendation to the fatwa committee that yes, I mean, this is subhanallah, this is a very unique case where that lady actually is in desperate need to consume riba. There is a daroor here. If she does not do so, the money will be gone. The principal, I mean, in, in Egypt, I mean, welcome. And the inflation and, and, and the corruption there, subhanAllah. So if she does not open a saving account with a fixed income that is enough to take care of the basic expenses, okay, of the living expenses of her kids, she will be gone. What do you think? Can she open a saving account? You said so. <laughs> What's that? You said so. Did I say? Yes. Well, Allah Allah. So this is one of the major you know, destructive sins, war, war from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet, as, a, as we already like, you know, uh, repeated the ayah several times. If you are not willing to quit the remaining of interest, then you are waging a war or you are declaring a war against Allah and his, and his messenger. Prohibited everywhere because uh, <clears throat> According to a very strong approach within the Hanafi school of thought, within the Hanafi school of thought, that a ta'amul bil uqud al fasida, a ta'amul bil uqud al fasida, between the Muslim and the non Muslim in the war of the war, mubah, dealing or transacting between Muslims and non Muslims, in any invalid or void transaction in the abode of war, war of the war, is permissible, right? And this is again a very strong approach within the Hanafi school of thought. We have heard, you know, this fatwa. I mean, we, we, we hear it actually every, every now and then. Engaging in invalid transactions with non-Muslims in the abode of war is allowed. Again, I mean, this is a Hanafi approach, okay? The above fatwa, as I say here, is not sound opinion for the following reasons. It is not. Number one, from a pure fiqh perspective, if you compare the adillah of the Ahnaf and the adillah of the Jumhur, you will find easily, it's not our topic for tonight, but if you make a comparative fiqh between the adillah, you will find out the Hanafi approach, actually, with all due respect, is a weak one. I mean, la sanhadu bihi hujja. Riba is haram every time, everywhere. You live in Mecca al mukarramah you live in Las Vegas, excuse, excuse me, you live in Nigeria, you live in Jordan. It, I mean, it makes no difference. Riba actually is haram. Like any other prohibited matters in Islam, okay, riba is, is still haram. It's number one. Uh, the, number two, if you want to go literally with the madhab, they permitted actually receiving interest and not paying interest to others. If you want to go with that approach, then receiving, because the Muslim actually is benefiting. Well, what we are talking about here in the U.S. is Muslims paying riba to others, particularly when it comes to mortgaging homes. You are the one who is financially exploited and taken advantage of. So this again is the fatwa. And of course, I mean, USA is not on a border for it's not, it's not Daru Harb. To be honest, I mean, and, 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 and fair enough with the Hanafi approach, al Hanafi يقسمون الدار إلى قسمين دار الإسلام وما سواه يسمى دار الحرب. So they have like a like like a like a classification of the of of the abodes. They have only two, nothing in between. It's either white or black. Anything that is not called دار الإسلام is by default called دار الحرب. But it does not mean technically that this is a an abode of war. No, it is not. It could be Daru Ahd, like an abode of, of, uh, of covenant, right? America for us Muslims living here is not an abode of war. I mean, alhamdulillah, we have our own masajid, our own Islamic schools and universities. I mean, our gathering here 
is a very clear evidence that you are not living in a, in a board of war. We are enjoying the safety and the security and the luxury of living here in this society. The freedom of religion that we have here in the USA is way more than the freedom of religion and speech that we have back home in what is so-called Muslim world. So it is, it, is, it is absolutely, absolutely incorrect, absolutely incorrect to claim or to think that USA actually is an abode of war. Absolutely it is, it is not. Some of the excuses that we live in a non-Muslim society, not because you want to follow the, the, the Hanafi approach, no. Because, I mean, the, 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 the riba system actually is prevailing, right? I mean, this is the mainstream practice. It's almost, almost unavoidable. And you will be finding out this presentation that most of those, most of those haram, haram transactions before, because of riba are avoidable. And in many cases, there is an Islamic alternative. There is an Islamic alternative. We talked about opening a saving account. How about opening a mutual fund account? How about opening a mutual fund account with Muslim-based, uh, they call them uh, ethically responsible mutual fund account? Instead of making 2 or 3% haram interest in a saving account, you can make 10%, 10% halal uh, profit while, while opening a, a mutual fund account investment account in a, in a halal way. SubhanAllah, when there is a will, there is a way. Whatever is haram, you will find in most cases, you, you, I mean, you will find an Islamic, Islamic uh, alternative for it. So this is not a, a, a valid excuse, and the difficulty in avoiding it or living in, in a capitalist economic system society is not an excuse as well. By the way, the interest, like the, 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 the capitalist economic system, where riba actually is a built-in component. Is it all in the USA? Is it all in the USA? Well, it's a, it's a global system. It's a global one. If you go to Saudi Arabia, the, the finance system actually is Arabia based. Back home, Jordan, my, 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 my homeland, the whole system actually is a, is a riba one. With some few exceptions, I have heard, I'm not sure, that in Pakistan, the finance system actually is an Islamic one. How much they implement the Islamic finance, I have no clue. I have heard that in Sudan, for example, the whole finance and banking system is an Islamic one. How serious they are in, in implementing Islamic finance, I have no clue. But the vast majority of, of the Muslims of, of the of the like countries in the Muslim world, they I mean, they, you know, their finance system is just a global capitalist interest and in, interest based one, where where interest actually is a built-in component in the system. So honestly, there is no big difference between living in the USA versus living in in the Muslim world when it comes to, you know, the prevalence of, of, of riba. Means are like objectives. Some, no? Oh, time's up maybe. Or the computer is tired. Is, is Hussam around? Brother Hussam? Maybe, maybe it's, uh, it's a time for break, Sheikh. We can break. From the divine. Khalas, uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll just take, uh, we pray Salat al-Isha and we come back right after Salat al-Isha, inshallah. We come back, uh, can come back right after Salat al-Isha, inshallah, ta'ala. Uh, please remain with us. It will be half an hour after Salat al-Isha and tomorrow, inshallah, ta'ala, the program will start 10 and prayer to the program will be having breakfast together, inshallah, ta'ala. Please join us for the breakfast. And inshallah ta'ala, let's now pray Salat al-Isha and come back. Jazakumullah khair. Just a quick reminder that if, if you already made a pledge to support Guidance College, here is, the, here is the booth by the door. We do have the pledge forms, we do have the donation box, and we have the credit card machine. If you made a pledge, please fulfill your pledge, you know, before I charge you interest. So like if you wait until Sunday, I'll charge you interest. No, no, guidance, guidance, yeah, guidance College actually is a degree granting institute. It's, it's a university. It has nothing to do with guidance, residential, the Islamic mortgage company. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Moving on, as you see here, Means are like objectives. Means are like objectives. This is this means that al al wasailu la hukmul ghayat. 
if your goal actually is noble because actually some of the activists here especially like lay you know laymen people who do not have I would say you know enough knowledge in, in Islamic finance or in the Islamic fiqh in general they call actually for getting involved in riba to strengthen the finance of the Muslim to be more influential to be more financially you know stable and they come up with a package of excuses that the more you get involved in the system the more money you will be having the more strength and power the more influential you will become in the society and here is the answer actually here is the answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the legislator he is the one who decides what's haram and what's halal as well as his prophet alayhi salatu wa salam ما حله الله ورسوله فهو الحلال وما حرمه الله ورسوله فهو الحرام The most important thing actually during your whole lifetime is to abide by the rules of Allah Azza wa Jal and if you say that, that violating the rules and dealing with interest will bring more power to the Muslim community excuse me, maybe you did not mean it but you are, you are challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you are telling Allah, Ya Allah, you do not know, I know more than you. You prohibited riba. Riba is supposed to be permissible because we cannot be powerful without dealing with riba. And this is actually something that has really severe consequences when you challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his sovereignty and his, you know, uh, uh, jurisdiction to legislate what's haram and what's halal. That's exactly like the example of someone, excuse me all, who is stealing money to donate the stolen money, give them to the, to the needy. Well, your noble is cause, but the means to reach to that cause actually is not, is not a noble one. You steal money to donate it? No. You work hard, you make halal money, and then you donate. And likewise, if you want to be financially influential, you can. And you will see as we go, inshallah, with the presentation, that as I always say, when there is a will, there is a way. Wallahi, we can challenge the system in the USA and establish our own Islamic finance institutes. We have tens of good examples to follow. Tens of good examples. I was discussing with the Mashaykh today the possibility of your community here establishing your own Islamic mortgage company off the system, away from Freddie Mac and Freddie Mac. You can put your resources together and just establish a genuine and sound and 100% halal Islamic mortgage company only to serve your own community. What does it take to do so? When there is a will, there is a way. Moving on. Necessities remove restrictions. That's absolutely correct. We do have a default rule and we have an exception. Default rule and exception. The default rule is that riba is haram. The exception, whenever someone comes across a necessity, according to the definition of necessity in the Islamic system, not based on our own desires, because sometimes actually I do have five, seven million you know, dollars worth of business, and I find myself so desperate to borrow another two or three millions to strengthen and to empower myself and to upgrade my system. Well, this is not a necessity. This is not. Okay? I try to convince myself that I'm doing something you know, good, but actually it is not. Necessity has its own definition. If that definition is implemented and proven, then yes, the floor is, is open. I said several times, someone is running out of resources. He wants to provide food on the table for his family members. He wants to pay the tuition fees for his kids. He wants to pay for the rent of his house. No halal, no interest, like sadaqa, what do you call it, qardun hasan, interest-free loan. Can that person borrow money with interest? Of course, actually, he can, because the necessity actually is, necessity is there. Ask fiqh councils, it's always, always like safer to go with collective, collective opinions or collective professional opinions or fatwa, if you wish, versus going with certain individuals. Certain muftin might be lenient in certain area, might be very conservative in certain area. Excuse me, although he or she is, is a mufti, but it does not mean that he comprehends all the different abwab and chapters actually of fiqh, some people actually are well known to be very advanced in, in their understanding of the Islamic inheritance law. But they are not that professional in, in, in food, for example, and medicine. They are not that professional in the Islamic judiciary system, or in the Islamic penal law, or in the Islamic finance system. So do not, do not put like all, like eggs in, in one basket, as they say. Do not refer to only one mufti. If, if you find an authentic, reputable, well acceptable fiqh counsel, I would say stick to it. 
right? One of those, like, you know, uh, suggestions, I would say, is our Fiqh Council, the Assembly of Muslim Jurors of, of America. We do have, actually, uh, uh, the Presidential uh, Committee, right? And then we have the Resident Fatwa Committee, Resident, the Permanent Fatwa Committee, seven different members living in the USA for years and years. Okay? Uh, uh, the, the Secretary General, the head of this committee, is Sheikh Salah Al-Sawi, our Sheikh, and we have six more members. One of them is, is Dr. Muhammad Al-Zuhayli, who is a well-known faqih, who came from the Emirates, Syrian faqih, who came here to the USA a few years ago. Al-Abdul Faqir, myself, and some other mashayikh from different states in the USA. What is unique about those people, again, is that, alhamdulillah, they are well known to be specialized in fiqh al-Islami in particular. It's not only PhD in Islamic studies, no, it's PhD in fiqh or in comparative fiqh, like in, in, in the Sharia and the Islamic law, plus living in the USA for, for a long period of time, plus being involved heavily with the community. We always receive questions, okay? We get educated, as I told the Mashaykh today, we get educated by our community more than what we educate our community. And one more time, I start with only 12 or, or, or 13 slides 20 years ago. Now, alhamdulillah, I have, I have 390 plus slides. And the, the majority of those information came as a feedback from the, from the community, alhamdulillah. However, uh, collective fatawa are not equivalent to ijma'. Be careful, do not, do not confuse yourself. Ijma' actually is the unanimity or the consensus of all scholars at a certain era on a certain rule. That is close to impossible to take place nowadays. However, having, having a, a collective fatwa by a fiqh council, okay, like AMJA, for example, the Assembly of Muslim Jurors of America, or if you follow our sister organization, the European Council of Fatwa and Research. This is a well-established, mashallah, fiqh council, but they serve the Western general, like USA, Canada, and even uh, Europe. While uh, assemblies of Muslim Jurors of America, we are limiting ourselves to uh, USA and, and Canada. Referring to those fiqh councils actually is safer for you because this is a collective effort has been done by a group of, of people of knowledge, not only one individual. Now, the second part of the presentation is summary of the types of interest. Okay, here is the technical definition, and again, it's like a very boring, uh, uh, I would say, part of the presentation but you have to go through it. And if you memorize those technical definitions by heart, you will do yourself a favor because those definitions will help you a lot, you know, uh, comprehending and, and going further, inshallah, with the contemporary transactions. Here is the definition of riba in general. It is the increase or delay or both. So we have one category called the riba of increase, riba al-fadl, and we have another category called riba and nasa or riba of delay, or both, okay? Both actually is a third category, which is riba nasiyah, when riba al-fadl, or riba of increase, and riba of delay, both are combined together, taking place simultaneously in a certain transaction, that's called riba nasiyah. Fadl, nasa, nasiyah. Riba of increase, riba of delay, and riba an nasiyah. Increase or delay, or both in submitting certain assets and certain transactions. So we have one category, and we have a second category, and a third category, submitting certain assets. Not every single asset, by the way, is a riba-based one, right? We have only certain assets who are subject to riba. Certain items, we call them. Al-amwal al-ribawiyya. Food and money, that's it. Food and, and money. In certain transactions, believe it or not, we have only two different transactions in the whole Islamic finance system. Two different transa transactions are subject to riba. They might be affected by riba. Aqdul qard, the loan agreement, and the sale agreement. If there is no loan agreement, if there is no sale agreement, then you are you are safe enough, unless otherwise proven. Unless otherwise pr proven. So riba of increase, riba of delay, and riba, riba and nasiya. Let's start with the first one. Riba al fadl means the exchange of homogeneous commodities. It did happen that Bilal radiallahu anhu, Bilal ibn Rabah, offered the Prophet uh, like a good quality date fruit or tamar to eat. He asked him, where did you get that tamar from, that date from? 
He said, Ya Rasulullah, can I have a tamar on radi? We used to have like a bad quality date, and we exchanged maybe five pounds for three pounds. قال لا تفعل. Do not do that anymore. And Subhanallah, can can you believe it? Bilal رضي الله عنه المبشر بالجنة. I mean, this is like you know off topic. Bilal was granted Jannah during his lifetime. He was not educated enough in riba. Can you believe that? He committed riba unknowingly. And what was the reaction of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Did he shout and scream and make a big deal out of it? Just educated him. Don't do it anymore. Okay? You sell what you have, you get the money, and you buy whatever you want. So you have to do them like in two different transactions. It's all about education, subhanAllah. Okay? Don't do it anymore. Sell what you have, get the money, buy what you have. So when it comes to exchanging homogeneous commodity, if you exchange five pounds of date food, with three pounds, different quality, that is, that is riba. Even if you submit immediately, right? Of course, I mean, this is based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-dhahabu bil-dhahabu, al-fiddatu bil-fiddah, wa al-tamru bil-tamru, al-milhu bil-milh, mithlan bi-mithl, yadan bi-yadha, awaha, faman zada, awa sazada, faqad arba al-hadith al-mashhur. And I will, inshallah, come across this hadith. But again, riba al-fadl, if you do like a spot transaction, you exchange, you exchange ten dollars for eleven dollars. Those examples do not take place in the real life. Do not get me wrong. They are just like, you know, fundamental information for us to comprehend and to understand. Someone might ask a question. Why the Prophet ﷺ is prohibiting $10 to be exchanged for $12 on the spot? Well, this is actually a nonsense business, right? I mean, no one would take $10 and, uh, you know, and, and take it back $12 on the spot. It does not happen. It's absolutely correct. The Prophet ﷺ does not want us to extract money from the money. He wants you, in order for you to make those two dollars, to involve that ten dollars in a business. You buy something, you sell it, you get involved, you add some like added, added uh, value to the society, you take some risk, and because of the transaction that you did, actual, real, tangible transaction, you deserve the two dollars that you want. That is the whole point behind the prohibition of exchanging homogeneous Homogeneous means identical, the same. Homogeneous commodities, food or money only. Only food and money. So the two useless items or two riba items are money and, and food. Anything that is not money, money, whether check or cash or credit or debit or even, even, even cryptocurrency nowadays, right? Anything that is not food, right? Not rice or sugar or, or fruit or I mean, anything that's not food, by default and not money by default is not subject to, to riba. Can you exchange one car for two cars? Yes, you can because car actually is not a is not a useless item. Can you exchange apple for apple with inequality? No, you cannot because this is a homogeneous uh, item. Sell the, 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 the apple that you have, okay? Get the money and buy whatever you want. Do them in two different transactions. So riba al-fadl, al-fadl actually means ziyad. Riba, al-fadl means al-ziyad. The exchange of homogeneous commodities, food or money only, for a cost plus. If you want to exchange Jordanian dollars for Jordanian dollars, they have to be five versus five. No more or no less. You cannot extract, you cannot derive money from the, from the money. That's why Prophet ﷺ prohibited riba, riba al-fadl. Riba of delay or riba al-nasa, the submission of one item, in any exchange of homogeneous commodity, submission of one item, in any exchange of homogeneous commodities, food or money only, while deferring the other item. While deferring the other items. How many useless items we have? Only two. Money, any kind of money, and food, any kind of food. If it did happen that you give someone five pounds of, of apple, right? not as a sale, as an exchange, right? And he hold that apple for, for one or two days and give it back to you, right? Or, for example, you exchange orange for apple. You give him the apple and he said, okay, I do not have the orange today. I'll come back tomorrow and give you the, the, the orange. And then he brought the orange next day, gave it to you. That's called riba nasa because there was a time gap in between. When it comes to exchanging food for food, money for money, it has to be like a spot transaction, immediate transaction, okay? Uh, currency exchange in any airport or any, any marketplace. You give the American dollars, okay? 
to the, to the business owner and you get the Jordanian dinars on the spot or the Kuwaiti dinars on the spot. That's halal, right? That's halal. So riba, riba, and nasa is the submission of one item in any exchange of homogeneous commodities. Orange for orange, apple for apple, date for date, uh, American dollars for American dollar, right? Food or money only while deferring the other item. There is no deference here. Mithlam bi mithl, yadam bi yad, ha awa ha. If there is any time gap, that will be counted as riba and nasa. Now, if you put those two different components together, you're going to end up with having the most severe prohibited level or category of riba, which is riba, riba and nasia. Riba and nasia actually means you exchange money or you lend money, right? So there's a time gap. You take money from Bank of America for two or three years, and then you pay it back after two or three years plus. That plus, that is, that is the, the, you know, the premium or the surplus actually is the, is the riba. So if al taqal fadlu ma'an nasa, sara riba riba nasiya. Riba nasiya is the one that is agreed upon its prohibition period. This is unnegotiable issue when it comes to Islamic finance. Riba nasiya. Maybe some of the Sahaba was arguing riba al-fadl, whether or not it, it is haram, but that's a different discussion. But when it comes to the riba nasiya or riba al-jahiliya or riba al-diyun, which is the premium that has to be or must be paid by the borrower to the lender, Along with, the, uh, along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity, that is, that's riba nasiya. Okay, you give someone, you give someone five pounds of dated fruit for maybe one or two months, right? In order for him to give it back to you, six pounds of dated fruit after one month. That's two different kinds of riba. The five pounds became six, and they were not giving back to you on the spot. There was a, a time gap of one month. Time gap is riba nasiya. The extra pound is riba al-fadl. Fadl ma'ana sa, we ended up having riba and nasiya. Clear? Again, yeah. Uh, those examples, okay, especially when it comes to food. I mean, we do not exchange barley for, for uh, you know, fruit or like, you know, khubz for sha'ir or and all these examples. They are there. They are authentic. They are correct. But they do not exist. They do not belong to our society. They are very irrelevant to our society, except when it comes to riba dune. This is actually the most prevailing, the most prevailing example that, that ruins 95, 97% of the, of the haram transaction in the US finance market, finance you know, system. They belong to riba nasiya. It's all about lending money with, with interest, right? Lending money with interest, borrowing money with, with interest. SubhanAllah, even like some people nowadays, cannot even imagine, imagine that you can borrow money with no interest. You take a loan from your employer, right? Interest-bearing loan. As a gesture from your employer, he says, okay, I'm gonna give you the loan for 3% APR, but I'm gonna pay the interest on your behalf. They cannot imagine that you know, someone can take interest-free loan. Sometimes you take a commitment from the car dealership that we're gonna give you zero APR, okay? And after two or three months, whenever the car is available, okay, you will be surprised that in the contract, 2% APR. And the salesperson would say, do not worry, we will pay the interest in your behalf. They have to in involve riba some way, somehow. You see? So again, the most prevailing, most prevailing, you know, uh, kind or category of riba nowadays is riba nasiya. Riba nasiya that belongs to a dune, interest-bearing loans, interest-bearing loans whether explicitly when you go to the bank and take a loan or otherwise through the different examples that I already explained before Aisha, opening a saving account, paying a late fees, over a draft charge uh, and, and so on and so forth. So the, the riba could be introduced directly or introduced indirectly, indirectly to do. As I said here, and nasia applies, what is this? Oh, mashallah. Allahumma jalni mustajab al-du'a, Allahumma jalni mustajab al-du'a, Allahumma jalni mustajab al-du'a. If you have only one da'wah to make, what is the best du'a? If you have one da'wah, like one time to make one du'a, the best du'a ever you can do is? Allahumma jalni mustajab al-du'a, Allahumma jalni, Mustajab dua. Whatever you make dua after that, inshallah, will be accepted. Smart investment. There you go. 
So that is that is riba nasiya. That's riba nasiya. Okay, riba items and riba contracts. Now we said uh, again. I just want to make sure we are on the same page. Increase or delay or both in submitting certain assets and certain transactions. Certain assets and certain transactions. We already talked about increase, delay, both of them. Now let's talk about the certain assets and certain transactions, right? Users items, al items who are subject to riba are food and money only. Only food and money. Anything that is defined as food is subject to riba. Which means that whenever we get involved in selling food, you need to be careful, especially when it comes to exchanging food for food. It's way easier, way easier if you exchange food for money because like the, the items are different. They are not identical. One category is money and one category is food. When it comes to exchanging food for food, you need to be extra careful, right? And when it comes to homogeneous items, you need to be extra careful as I will be reading for the experience. So useless items, items who are subject to riba, are food and money only, right? Useless transactions are loan contract, and as you see here, that's in general. That's in general, right? We said several times before Aisha, الديونو لها حكم القروض, in most cases. That's take the same, most probably take the same rule of loans. Remember the example of, uh, of the uh, uh, utility bill? You, you use, you utilize the service of T-Mobile for one month. Toward the end of the month, you owe the company $250 because you have utilized their service. You did not borrow money from them, but you owe them $250, for example. So, uh, useless transactions are loan contracts and debt in general, and sale contracts only. So, عقد البيع وعقد القرض. This actually means by default, if, if the agreement is a, is a lease to own agreement or lease agreement, it's not subject to riba to start with. It is not. If the agreement is an employment agreement, you work for a company, it's not subject to riba to start with. Unless actually riba is involved in it. Unless riba is involved in it. I'll give you an example. Lease agreement, you sign like, you know, you want to rent an apartment, lease an apartment, right? You have to pay $2,000 rent. If you default in paying in the first five days, you will be charged late fees. Thank you. That late fees will be counted as interest. But actually, it has been incorporated. It has been, like, you know, indulged in the lease. It's not a, a genuine part of it because the deal itself actually is not a deal itself is not a user's contract. It's not sale agreement. It's not a loan agreement. This is a lease agreement. So it's not even subject to riba to, to start with. As I said here, however, riba might be incorporated in other transactions as well. Okay, I do have some employees at, at Guidance College. Okay, I owe them, I owe them their salaries toward the end of the month. If there is an agreement that if I do not pay you before the end of the month, then I have to pay, I have to pay you fifty dollars per day or or one percent from your salary per day. That one percent, okay that percentage or that lump sum or one time like flat rate extra money will be counted as interest. Not because the employment agreement is a subject to interest, no. Because interest has been incorporated. It has been added up to the, to the, to the original agreement. That's why I said riba might be incorporated in other transactions as, as well. Cause of debt. We said that debt take the same rule of loans in most cases. Cause of debt. Causes for debt are wide ranging and are certainly not limited to loans. For business owners, for example, it includes the wages and salaries of employees. I do have employees at Guidance College. So I owe them their salary. They did not borrow money from them. I, I'm sorry. I did not borrow money from them, but actually I owe them their salary toward the end of the month. Customers. It includes payment plan. You go to uh, uh, best Buy, okay? You want to buy um, any kind of like appliances. Same as cash for 18 months. غسالة ولا مش عارف واشر ولا dryer. You buy it for $1,000 cash. You buy it for $1,000 for 18 months. Same as cash. Which one actually is better? 
Of course, I mean, I mean why should you compromise $1,000 at once while you can break it down to 18 months? If it is the same as cash, you owe Best Buy, okay, the, the, the other like 11, 11 payments that you did not pay. So it's not, it's not a loan, it, it, it became a debt. You did not borrow money from them. You took, you took a ghassel, you took it home, appliances, right? Washer or dryer. And you paid, you, you made a payment for only the first payment. So whatever is remaining is technically called a, a debt. Means, means dayn wa laysa qardan. Al qard means the loan. Man the ladhi yuqridu allaha qardan hasanan. Referring to the sadaqa. Oh, that's the only uh, halal, halal interest-bearing loan. You give a qard to whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man the ladhi yuqridu allaha qardan hasan. Who is willing to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qard hasan? فيضاعف له أضعافا كثيرة. If Bank of America gives you three four percent, Allah سبحانه وتعالى gives you seven hundred percent أضعاف مضاعفة حلال hundred percent. وذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء سبحانه. So customers that includes payment plan or fees for utility service, fees for utility like water, electricity, phone bills as I already explained. Hence every loan falls under debt. Every loan. So every loan is a debt, but not every debt is a is alone, right? So, بَيْنَهُمَا عُمُومٌ وَخُصُوصٌ as we say. Nature versus wording. It is enough for, for the nature of the transaction to fall under debt, okay, broad definition, to be considered as such, as I already explained, even if it is not worded as a loan agreement or referred to as a debt. Again, you owe T-Mobile $250. You owe the, the utility bill $100. You owe your employees, right? By default, that, that debt okay, is there. You owe them, right? Whatever is defined as debt will be counted as loan unless otherwise proven. Why we are making that, that comparison? Because we have a lot of restrictions when it comes to giving a loan, right? It has to be, it has to be an interest-free one, right? And you, you, you do not take a loan unless you need that money. If you have enough money, you are not, I mean, supposed to apply for a loan and so on and so forth. That fundamental fiqh maxim was already explained. What matters in transaction is the essence and reality, not the wording or the formula. I want you to know this qaida fiqh maxim by heart. Al-ibratu fi al-uqood lil-maqasidi wal-ma'ani lal al wal-mabani. Do not get tricked by certain terms, okay? The word interest is removed and they put instead of it, oh, musharaka or murabaha or musharaka, no. I mean, we are not silly, alhamdulillah, we are well-educated in Islamic finance. We dig in depth and we find out what is the nature of the agreement. If it is proven that someone is giving money, loan or, or non-loan, we do not care, giving money, and that money is guaranteed to be paid back. And the, the premium on top of it, lump sum, one-time payment percentage, we do not care, is guaranteed as well. And that money advancer or financier is not taking a risk whatsoever. That is the interest-bearing loan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited, even if it is introduced to you as, as otherwise. Use this loan contract. Okay. If the borrower, if the borrower returns the loan with a stipulated increase, or stipulated increase, this is referred to as riba, riba al-fadl. You give, you give five pounds, five pounds of dirty fruit, and you take three pounds, or you give five and you take six. So there is an inequality, okay? So, so see here, uh, with a stipulated increase, this is referred to as riba al-fadl. Even if the transaction actually is a spot one, you take five and you, ta- you, you give five and you take six or seven, that's riba al-fadl. This is actually what happened with Bilal, radiallahu anhu, when he mistakenly did it. As soon as interest is introduced to the loan agreement, the agreement is rendered sinful. It became an interest-bearing loan. Whether that is the onset of the agreement or later agreed upon. Oh, this is actually a kind of problematic. You cannot proceed with a credit card without agreeing to paying interest. And I'm saying here, or later agreed upon, which means that you are willing from day one, you are willing from day one to pay interest in case of using your credit card for cash withdrawal. Right? And in some cases, believe it or not, in case of using your credit card for international transactions, be careful. Some of the credit card companies here, 
if you purchase some items from Algeria or from Pakistan, they charge you three different charges. Wire transfer fees. Wire transfer fees, which is fine. Currency exchange fees. They make some money from the currency exchange, from the local you know, currency, dollar to the other local currency. They make some, some money in between, which is fine. Some, some of those companies consider any kind of international transaction as if it is a cash withdrawal, believe it or not. If that is the case, then you cannot use that particular credit card for international transaction, just FYI. So as soon as the interest is introduced in a loan agreement, the agreement is rendered sinful, whether that is uh, on the onset, like upfront, like when you go to Bank of America to apply for a loan, okay, uh, of the agreement, or later agreed upon. Like what happened in the Jahiliya, you people used to lend to one another, and it's free. Upon the maturity of the loan, either the lender would approach the borrower by saying, take more time and pay me more, or the borrower would say, give me more time and I will pay you more. Both actually are haram, but they are not in the same level of prohibition. Be careful, right? Whenever riba is unavoidable, it has, I mean, you have to prove necessity, necessity to permit it. If the riba is avoidable, you have to prove haja, just public and general need to allow it. This is actually a general rule. If a certain agreement or contract does not, does not have any violations whatsoever, then it is halal by default. I mean, you do not have to convince me that I'm in desperate need to buy this house from Amin Housing, for example, that, that operates off the, the, the secondary market. It's halal. I mean, you don't have to tell me that I'm in need, right? Now, the more violations and glitches are proven to be existing in that contract, the more justification and need you need to prove to me as a mufti to give you a fatwa. Yes, I mean, we do have some violations in this agreement, but, but, but because of your haja, because of your need, you can take it. If those violations and glitches reach to a point where the whole agreement became aqdun fasid, avoid one. The riba actually is obvious here, 100%. Mortgaging a house, for example, based on what I would explain. Oh, you need to show me darura, necessity. I'm about to be thrown in the street. I cannot find any Islamic finance option. I cannot rent the apartment anymore because my family is big. I do not have enough income to rent a house, okay? I have been approved by Bank of America for a loan or by the FHA, Federal Housing uh, 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 Administration. Can I apply for a loan? My answer is yes, you can. Allah does not want you to be, to be excuse me, to be a homeless, right? If the only way for you to secure a house is to have an interest-bearing loan, mortgage or FHA, go for it, right? Why, why I give you a fatwa that it is permissible for you because of the darura? So I wish, I mean, now we see the whole picture. The, the aqd is halal, halal by default. Aqd does have certain amount of, of glitches and violations. You need to show me a haja to get a fatwa from me that this is halal. The aqd actually is haram. You need to show me a darura, necessity. In most cases, or some cases, life or death situation, right? In order for me to give you a fatwa that only for you, you can go with this, you know, with this, with this agreement. Sheikh, can I interrupt? Can you give examples of haja? You gave example of a darura, like extremely. Extreme. Every single individual lives in the USA is is an is an legitimate need for owning a house. So the haja actually is there. And instead of you actually wasting two thousand dollars every single month putting that money for rent, why do not you use the same amount to purchase your own house? Why do not you make sure that you leave a house for your family members? to live in after, after your death. Are you asking too much, like if you want to secure a house for your wife and your family to live in? No, you are not. This is the wasiyah of Prophet Leaving your legal heirs, your inheritors, financially stable is way better than leaving them needy, begging people. Do it smart. Do not waste those $2,000 in rent. Put those $2,000 in a house that you own. After 30 years, you will become the owner of the house, right? So this is, this is an example of a haja. Every single Muslim lives in the USA, in the USA is in need, in, in, in general need, okay, for purchasing a house, right? And based on that, if the contract that, that's offered to you by, 
guidance residential or by university systemic financial does have some violations, right? We can overlook those violations and just move on, okay? Unless you are approved, for example, by uh, Amin Housing. Amin Housing actually operates offline. It has nothing to do with the secondary market. Their, their content actually is good. We have no observation on it. Unless you have your own money to purchase your own house, it makes no sense to go and borrow money or finance a house while you have the ability of purchasing, you know, purchasing a house. Can, uh, we have just 10 minutes, Sheikh. Can we take a break and ask some important questions, inshallah? Sure, sure. Sheikh, talking about uh, Riba Play, Fadl, uh, uh, user loan. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think we, yeah, we can we'll, stop here we'll and continue to watch. Inshallah, we'll take a few minutes for questions and then we conclude for tonight, inshallah. Uh, uh, speaking of the, the different types of riba, the, there is a person here asking if I lend uh, somebody money with dollar and the agreement is this person to pay, me, to, to pay me back in whatever time, maybe a year, two more, but with a different currency. Let's, what is the Pakistani currency? Rubin. Rubin, yeah. So, uh, is it okay for the person to pay back with this currency, or does it have to be paid with the same uh, currency that I gave him, which is dollar? You the can, second part, yeah, yeah. The second part of the question, Sheikh, uh, we trade. Is the, if we do it in the different currency, is it the exchange of the day of giving, or is it the, the, the rate of the day of uh, the payment. طيب. Someone actually lended $1,000 American dollars to somebody else, right? He has to pay the exact amount, not the exact value. Now, by default, the, the borrower has to pay back $1,000. If they both agree on paying, paying the loan upon the majority of the loan after one year on the uh, Pakistani rupee, that would be fine. They have to find the currency exchange value, right? In the, in the day of the maturity, okay, in the day of the maturity of the loan, it is $1,000, okay? In, in, in November the 3rd, 2023, how much actually is the, how much is the American dollar, okay, comparison to the rupee? You do the math and you pay in rupee, that would be fine. It has to be بسعر الصرف يوم السداد. So, Jazakallah Khair. The second question, again, about money exchange. Uh, can you do exchange, but not on the spot? Meaning, I will give you $10,000 uh, $1, to give me a different currency, but with gap of time. No. So, it no. has to be immediate. It has to be immediate. However, in the real life, as we shall be explaining tomorrow, it might be account for account instead of hand by hand. Like nowadays when you do a forex business or currency exchange forex business, right? Uh, your other customer lives in Australia, in China. It takes three to five business days for the transaction to be settled through a third party, a bank or finance company or whatever. So as long as the transaction is immediate to the best of your knowledge, there, there is no further intentional delay. Okay, and your account actually is reporting the money and his account is reporting, receiving the money. Although there is an actual real, like, you know, time gap that could be, uh, that could be actually uh, overlooked because the situation nowadays actually is different. When Prophet ﷺ set those rules, people were like living and, and transacting like face to face. So there was no point behind the delay. Nowadays, I mean, we cannot avoid that unintentional delay because of the, like, nature of, of, of the business nowadays. So when you spoke, Sheikh, about riba al-fadl, which is the first type of riba, you mentioned that if you give you $10, you cannot give $11 or $9. It has to be $10 with $10. So if somebody would like exchange, like he won't give you a bill of $10 and needs bills of $1, but he has only $9 with him and he needs exchange, is it okay or does it have to be $10 with $10? Can he give you nine dollars and said, "I will give you the other one dollar later on"? I have only nine dollars right now. By default, no. I mean, I, I mean, this is a currency exchange. It has to be, you know, it has to be ten, ten for ten, with no if, time gap. If I, if I recall, there was a fatwa by Sheikh uh, Ibn Athimin. Let me let me double check this question, inshallah, and get back to you tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. 
it's not a loan, it's just like giving a change. The no. change, but, but I don't have it with me right now. I need like one dollar bill. So you give me 10 and I give you nine because I don't have with me mm. 10 right now. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's put it in hold inshallah until I double check. Okay, so the, the other question is about, I think this is answered. He's asking or she's asking about the, the, the foreign exchange. Is it considered homogeneous in Al Fadl, Wirib Al Fadl? No, currency exchange actually, it has to be with, with, with two different currencies, otherwise, it makes no sense. Right? You have, you have a, currency, a currency exchange agency or business, it means that you exchange from American dollars to Jordanian dinars, to Algerian, what, what's your amla there? Dinar. D -d Dinar and so on and so forth. And you make some money uh, in between. I mean, the revenue actually is for the currency exchange, which is fine. فإذا اختلفت هذه الأصناف فبيعوا كيف شئتم إذا كان يدا بيد so I exchange the American dollar for 70 قرش like cent in, in, in Jordan okay. as a businessman I might give it only for like you know only 68 which is fine and I keep two cents like for myself as, as a revenue that would be fine so you can make profit of money exchange as long as it is immediate on the spot there is no gap. Accent. as long as it is it is immediate and this is actually how the currency exchange industry in the usa and the, all over the world they make money right there is something called the yeah. that difference actually is the is the revenue that they make yeah yeah there is a lot of questions a lot of questions but it will be answered tomorrow inshallah ta'ala about mortgages about so many things inshallah ta'ala so if there is any question related to this topic we can take it on the spot otherwise we conclude go ahead now, by the way we had 18 minutes interest actually like above 9 9 p.m but that's fine that's a halal reversion <laughs> inshallah go ahead brother Zofa. So let me repeat the question. Can I lend thousand dollars and in the US and that would be fine as long as the are you the lender or the borrower? You are the lender. So you give me one thousand dollars loan. Yeah. And you tell me that that's okay, it, it's a due in January two thousand twenty three, but I will be in Uzbekistan. You send me the money to Uzbekistan, right? As a borrower, I have to pay out of pocket maybe $10, $15, right? For the Western Union to send you the $1,000. You are not benefiting from the money. You are not putting $15 on, on pocket. You receive only $1,000. I pay, I pay on top of the $1,000, $15 for the wire transfer for, 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 for uh, Western Union, okay? But this is actually a service fees that I committed myself. So we ended up me paying more than what I have taken, but it's still halal because you are not benefiting from the difference. See what I'm saying? Well, that, that, that's halal. How about if there, is a, if there is a benefit, but not money benefit? For example, if it will be difficult for me, for example, I work here in the US, it will be difficult for me to transfer money to Algeria. We have a horrible economic system. So. I tell somebody who wants my money now, I tell him, here is $10,000, but you pay me back in Algeria. I am benefiting because it is difficult for me to transform money. So it is a service for me. Is this halal? So there is a benefit, but not money benefit. I am benefiting because it will be difficult for me to transform my own money. Security benefit. Security Assurance. benefit, or, or there is a lot of regulations, like you have to only transfer a certain amount of money. So. The question is, if the definition of riba كل قرض جرد نفعا للمقرض فهو ربا. So if, is this benefit has to be money or any type of benefit is it considered riba because you are borrowing with interest? Generally speaking, أخي, any kind, any kind of benefit. عرفت؟ يعني uh, let's say for example, I told someone, okay, I'm willing to give you. $1,000 loan, okay, with one condition, that you give me a ride to the hotel, right? Just an example, alhamdulillah, I have my rental car, so do not worry. So, so the, 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 the lender, which is me, is benefiting indirectly from that loan, right? Non-monetary benefit, which yeah. is a free ride to the, to the hotel. That's Count Riva. 
count so the that's river. Count river. That's count the river. I gave someone ten thousand dollars to upgrade his business with one condition that you need to hire my son to work for you. That's riba. Okay? I'll give you one thousand if you invite me for dinner tonight. That's that, that's riba. Although it's not a, a monetary one, but actually it's a kind of faid. I think means benefit. Any benefit. Any benefit. Based on that, you said that you benefit from securing the fund, yeah. like assuring receiving the fund. Yes, so if I will transfer my own money, to, for example, $10,000 to Algeria, is there going so much regulations? I may lose some money. I may have so many regulations, right? So pay fees. So I would say, okay, I will give you $10,000, but give it to my parents in Algeria or give it to my partners in Algeria, give it to my family in Algeria. Is this uh, riba? Sorry. I will take it so inshallah, inshallah as a, Sheikh will as a homework. Ahead, That's my homework for tonight, inshallah. That inshallah will be discussed tomorrow, tomorrow. capitalizing the interest. But basically, it's not an ideal option. It's not. Because actually, the, you know, the Samai Riba nature actually is, is very obvious there. You capitalize the interest, you negotiate, you, you negotiate increasing the price, not decreasing the price. Now, the non-Muslim salesperson looks at it from a different perspective. He thinks that you are paying the interest up front because in order for him to give you zero APR, he will be asking for a book, like a big chunk of money as a down payment. That's why commonly it's known buy out interest. Unfortunately, Honda Finance is, is, is financially, administratively, legally, is an independent organization that has nothing to do with, with, with Honda car dealership, unless otherwise proven. So you are borrowing from a third party, unfortunately. So we, but it will be discussed that, in details tomorrow, inshallah. Sheikh Hussam? Right. So let me repeat the questions for those who are online. Sheikh Hussam is asking about gold and silver are also riba, riba, um, uh, subjected to riba. So his question, can I buy with money, with a currency, dollar or otherwise, buy gold or silver with installment plan? According to the four different madhahib, you cannot. Because gold is gold. If you want to follow the, the, the approach of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi, and his student Ibn al-Qayyim, they both believe that jewelry is not, a, is not a currency, it's a commodity. It's like the furniture and the chair and the carpet. And so based on that, I mean, bay'u al-dhahab bil-taqseed, like, you know, buying jewelry, not, not, not like ounces of, no, no, jewelry, right? Jewelry for women to use. Bil-taqseed in installment is halal. But this is again, I mean, this is outside the form, you know, the form of that. For me, for me, I see a lot of fiqh in what Ibn Taymiyyah said. Because actually what we care about is the outcome, you know, outcome result, the final product. Really, I mean, jewelry is not, is not a currency. You cannot go to Walmart, okay, uh, and buy some food for the, uh, for the earring, for example, or for the ring. And give them, the, you know, the ring uh, as a price. It's not used as a, you know, as, as a currency. So it would be safer to go with the form of that, right? However, going with the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah, honestly, is, is, is legitimate enough. I will, uh, is there any sister, because we took all the brothers, is there any sister has any question? Inshallah, we'll take the brother over, yes, yes. Somebody who 
Honestly, I, I didn't get the exact question. I'm sorry. Can, can, can you send it? Can, can you, because it's almost 9.30. Can you send this question in writing to the Sheikh, inshallah ta'ala? He will, he will address it the first time probably tomorrow, inshallah. But we have... My bad. Honestly, yeah. I, I, I didn't comprehend the question. I'm sorry. I think we, we really have to conclude. We have sisters with us. They have families. So inshallah ta'ala, we will take the questions. If you can send it in writing or inshallah ta'ala tomorrow, will answer the questions. Inshallah ta'ala, we conclude for tonight. I will give the chance to Sheikh uh, to conclude, inshallah. Tfadl. Do you think it is a good idea to like keep the questions on hold for tonight, inshallah? So, so like once we finish, just keep the questions and inshallah, we'll continue uh, tomorrow. That inshallah yani, will be the end of our session for tonight. I did not finish the first part of it, which is the technical details of riba, but inshallah, we'll, we'll continue tomorrow. And then we'll move on to the practical examples, bank loans and mortgage and life insurance and credit card, like those practical examples that everybody actually is uh, waiting for and financing homes and financing cars, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, shadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Here's my business card if you want to take yeah. it. Inshallah ta'ala tomorrow the breakfast is 9.30 and the session inshallah ta'ala will start 10. If you can bring some uh, breakfast to share, that will be appreciated and the masjid will provide some inshallah ta'ala.